Up next, the House Energy and Commerce Oversight Subcommittee gets an update on the Superfund, a federal program to clean up hazardous waste sites across the country. Pursuant to the call of the chair, the subcommittee and oversight and investigations hearing into the Superfund Reauthorization Act amendments of 1986 is hereby called to order. It has been 20 months since Superfund amendments and the Reauthorization Act was signed into law. One third of the five year reauthorization program has thus been completed. I think it's time to give this new program its first trimester report card. And as we do that, I think it's important to take a good look at the goals we set for the new and improved Superfund program and to see how the implementation of that program has measured up to those goals. As we stood on the floor of the House prepared to vote in October of 1986 on the SARA conference report, I emphasized the importance of three elements of the program. The first was the risk to which hazardous waste posed to the health and welfare of the American people. The second was how we could deal with it and the realities that those problems presented. And the third was fashioning a responsible solution to those problems. At that time, I said, and I quote, we need to deal with these realities in a way that gives us a program that makes sense. We want these cleanups to be done promptly. We want them to be done right the first time. And we do not want taxpayers' dollars wasted. As many of you have remembered, one of my favorite expressions during the reauthorization of that year was that we must not set the program up to fail. I believed in October 86, as I do today, that we succeeded in that effort. What does this first report card indicate? Is the Superfund program, in fact, on a course headed for success, or, it is struggling, or is it struggling for a passing grade? From the information we have gathered in preparation for this hearing, it appears that all is not well particularly in the pace of remedial activity, the vigor of the enforcement program, and the selection of cleanup remedies that emphasize permanent treatment of the waste and permanent resolution of the problems. There is some substantial good news. The agency is doing well in meeting the statute's targets for initiating remedial investigations and feasibility studies. In fact, the EPA exceeded its RIFS targets for fiscal years 1987, and it appears likely that the agency will meet its deadline of October 1989 for the 275 first starts for RIFSs that are required by the Act. EPA has, secondly, developed an excellent removal program with over 315 removals undertaken since the 1986 amendments. These important removal actions reduce the immediate exposure and eliminate the immediate threats to the surrounding population and the environment. The agency has also successfully met its April 1988 statutory deadlines for conducting preliminary assessments on the surplus list, with over 6,000 preliminary assessments completed as of the end of April of this year. Today we will hear from witnesses from both inside and outside the EPA. First we will take testimony from the Hazardous Waste Treatment Council and several major environmental groups concerning a comprehensive environmental industry report that they will release today focusing on recent cleanup decisions. This report presents an analysis of all Superfund's records of decisions, ROTS, that were signed by the agency in the first fiscal year since the SARA was enacted in fiscal year, for 19, fiscal year 1987, a total of 75. Today is also the occasion of the release of the Office of Technology Assessment Report, an analysis of 10 selected Superfund cleanup decisions signed since the enactment of SARA. Neither report presents a very happy picture. We do see repeated examples of inconsistency in remedies chosen at sites, even where the same contaminants and similar circumstances are present. We see inconsistency in cost of the remedies, a lack of coordination and information sharing among the 10 EPA regions as to what remedies have previously been implemented and how successful that implementation was, and a lack of attention to the cleanup standards and permanent treatment requirements that this committee labored so hard to implement in SARA. We will also hear from a major contractor, CH2M Hill, 
as to how to improve and expedite the Superfund RIFS process. While the agency is making good progress in getting the studies underway, the current average time for completion of these is 28 to 33 months, a time most of our constituents concede is vastly too long. We'll also hear from Clean Sites Incorporated, a well-known private organization established to help facilitate the cleanup of Superfund sites. They will speak to us about the lack of effective enforcement of the Superfund program. Of particular interest that will be submitted to the committee record is an article recently published in Chemical Week entitled Superfund, Uncle Sam Picks Up the Tab. To quote briefly from that article, let me reference that the principle that the polluter should pay, what we believed parenthetically to be the cornerstone of the Superfund program, is, according to this article, crumbling. And, they assert, EPA is itself undermining the program. Instead of aggressively pursuing parties the agency has identified as responsible for site contamination to get them pay their fair share, EPA is simply footing the bill. We knew full well at the creation of this program uh, over 20 months ago that there was not sufficient money in it or intended to be in it to clean up all of these sites themselves. That is why we put in rigorous requirements to assure that those who helped create this problem also pay for remedying it. For example, no Superfund Section 106 injunctive orders have been referred to the Justice Department for remedial action since the passage of SARA. That's an easy number to calculate. It looks a lot like a zero. The agency has not even established a management target for Section 106 actions. And in the two years following the passage of SARA, the Superfund program was budgeted for 96 consent decrees for voluntary PRP cleanups, yet according to the EPA's own Office of Enforcement and Compliance Monitoring, only 21 have been entered into by a district court through the third quarter of fiscal year 88. Notably, EPA Regions 1 and 3 account for more than half of all the PRP settlements for remedial work. Why are these two regions so far ahead of the curve, and why are the others so far behind? The central theme of most of the testimony we will be receiving today, both oral and written, is this. The Superfund statute is sound and workable, but it is not necessarily being properly administered or enforced. This may in many respects be explained by the fact that the National Contingency Plan has yet to even be proposed. And in fact, without that finalization, no good NCP can even lead the Superfund program to success even if it was done by itself. We look forward to testimony today from Dr. Wynne Porter. I believe that they have the spirit and the goodwill to try to make this program work. But I'm sure that Dr. Porter and others at EPA also remember that in an almost unprecedented way, it was the EPA sitting at the conference table with this members and other conferees in helping to fashion and form a workable program that can effectively and efficiently remedy the Superfund hazardous waste problem in the United States. We will also have with us today Dr. James Mason, Director of the Center for Disease Control, and his associate, Dr. Barry Johnson, to speak to the status of the implementation of the Section 104 health authorities. The health provisions of SARA were very important to most of the members of this committee, simply for the reason of helping to address the deep and egregious public concerns as to what jeopardizes their health, safety, and welfare by finding themselves living next to a Superfund hazardous waste site. This oversight hearing is an important part of making sure that what Congress intended becomes a reality. We do not have any interest, inclination, or intention of using this hearing or the activities of this committee uh, to pillory or attack those uh, who are responsible for administering the program. But let no one fail to understand that a government program of which many thousands of constituents place great demands is in danger of foundering upon the rocks of mismanagement and inattention if we do not get our act together. I'm pleased to, to, to recognize our ranking Republican, gentleman from Virginia, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee notice for this hearing announced that the hearing would be on the implementation of the Superfund amendments 
and Reauthorization Act of 1986, SARA, and the overall progress of the Superfund program. I take it then that this hearing is to serve as a report card for the Superfund amendments of 1986 and the Superfund program as a whole. But how will we measure success? Some would measure success by setting and meeting deadlines, although some of my colleagues and I resisted such measures. The Superfund amendments did establish schedules for certain activities. We may hear today that these schedules have been met or are close to being met and so we should deem this program a success. Others would measure success by the amount of money that has been spent. If that is the measure, then certainly this program has been successful. But meeting deadlines and budgets are worthless unless we accomplish the overall goal of Superfund to protect human health and the environment from the effects of uncontrolled or abandoned hazardous waste sites. Currently in my district, there are three hazardous waste sites on the national priority list. Renner Kill Richmond, CNR Battery Chesterfield, and Defense General Supply Center Chesterfield. And not a single site has been cleaned up. One such frustrating example is the waste site at the D Defense General Supply Center. On the list since 1985, this first was examined under the old Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RECRA. However, in 1986, when Congress passed the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, the study process had to be started all over again under the new guidelines. Today, three years later, the study continues as does the contamination of groundwater and the un underutilization of valuable adjacent property. EPA has done an adequate job of recognizing sites and in initiating remedial investigation feasibility studies. However, the system seems to break down at this point. RIFS studies are taking too long, and sometimes the remedial action is patchwork. Also, EPA does not seem to take advantage of their authority to enter into expedited final settlements with de minimis waste contrib contributors to Superfund sites. Finally, coordination between EPA regional headquarters in Washington often seems to be lacking. <clears throat> but today should not be dedicated only to problem spotting, but rather to problem solving. The scope and complexity of this national problem is greater than we ever had imagined. Today, I hope the witnesses will not only make statements, but make recommendations as well. How can we streamline the RIFS system? How can we support private contractors so that they feel like part of the team and not like a scapegoat? Today, we are one third of the way through the five-year program. I think it is clear that there is much room for improvement. It is also clear that we must all work together if we are properly to manage this national problem. I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses and hope that we can reach a better understanding of what it takes to effectively manage Superfund. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank my colleague for his remarks and uh, would like to join him in the spirit in, in which they are offered. Our constituents uh, demand that of us and, and of this committee, and, and I'm appreciative. I would like to uh, invite our first panel to uh, take their seats at the table. Mr. William A. Wallace, Director, Hazardous Waste Management, CH2M Hill. Mr. Thomas Grumbly, President of Clean Sites uh, Incorporated. Mr. Richard Fortuna, Executive Director of the Hazardous Waste Treatment Council, accompanied by Ms. Linda Greer. Mr. Doug Wolf, Attorney for the Natural Resource Defense Council. And Mr. Blake Early, Washington Representative of the Sierra Club. To our witnesses, I would advise you that there is a copy of the rules of the uh, committee and uh, a brief summary of the rules of the House uh, at the table in front of you. As is the custom of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, a uh, custom begun under uh, a predecessor chair, uh, Speaker Sam Rayburn, we uh, take all of our testimony under a uh, written oath, uh, under a sworn oath. Do any witnesses have any objections to being sworn? I would also like to remind each of our witnesses, several of whom are attorneys, uh, that they do have the right to be represented by counsel, counsel to be present, of course, for the purposes of advising the client and not uh, providing testimony, uh, a lesson we learned in a uh, joint uh, committee uh, investigating another matter some, some months ago. And so if any of you desire to be represented by counsel, you may, may so do at this time. 
If not, let me ask each of the witnesses to please rise and raise their right hands and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear that the testimony I'm about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Consider yourself sworn. And our first witness will be Mr. Richard Fortuna, Executive Director of the Hazardous Waste Treatment Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bliley, uh, the committee, uh, for the opportunity to testify this morning. My name is uh, Richard C. Fortuna. I am Executive Director of the Hazardous Waste Treatment Council. We are the largest association of high-tech treatment firms in the country, managing hazardous waste to protect the environment over the long term. We represent 65 companies with facilities in 48 states. Pleased that the committee has called this hearing this morning uh, due to the uh, important timing of the issuance of the National Contingency Plan amendments that the chairman alluded to in his opening statement, the amendments or the, the regulatory amendments to implement the new Superfund law. At this hearing, we are releasing the first comprehensive survey of all EPA cleanup decisions conducted during 1987. The report is jointly prepared by the Hazardous Waste Treatment Council in conjunction with six of the nation's leading environmental groups, the EDF, NRDC, Sierra Club, Audubon Society, National Wildlife Federation, and U.S. PERG. I'm accompanied this morning by Linda Greer, who is the principal investigator for our report, and the testimony this morning will be jointly presented by myself, as well as Mr. Early from the Sierra Club, and Mr. Wolf from the NRDC. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bliley, uh, this committee spent the better part of three years rewriting a very difficult statute, the Superfund, back from 1984 through 1986. Mm -hmm. And to be certain, the 1980 law contained many significant deficiencies. The law was underfunded, the definition of cleanup was left very vague, and the selection of remedy was essentially allowed to, to be governed by the principle of least cost, technologically achievable method. Now, while expectations obviously differ for the 1986 reforms and 1986 statute, it is few can argue that there were fundamental reforms to the, the, and changes to the selection of remedy process and the role of cost effectiveness. Instead of simply choosing the cheapest remedy as the 1980 law dictated, the 1986 law dictates that we choose the least cost way of achieving a permanent remedy. If Sarah's reform stood for nothing else, it was that we put an end to the shell game. We stop the perpetuation of mistakes of the past. We stop relying on mere capping and containment and institute technology-based permanent remedies wherever practicable. All of us in our respective organizations, the environmental organizations as well as our own, had anecdotal reports of bad decisions being made in records of decision Superfund sites that were alluded to in both of the opening statements. But we're not cer certain whether this was a pattern or just good reporting on bad decisions. So we undertook a survey of every record of decision conduct made by the EPA during fiscal year 1987 to determine whether these problems were indeed sporadic or endemic. We looked for both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And frankly, what we found that there was that there were some good decisions, many bad, and several downright ugly decisions. Eight years after the original Superfund has passed, after three years of effort to rewrite the law, and two years after, after enacting these landmark reforms, we find that the remedy selection process by the agency during 1987 is virtually identical to those of the early year of the program. Capping and containment remain the dominant remedy as it was in 1981. Little, there is fact, frankly little evidence that the 1986 law has ever passed. What the law has stimu stimulated is EPA's semantic creativity to rationalize the remedies of the past and continue the Superfund shell game. The results in brief, 68% of the records of decision, of the 75 records of decision, involve no treatment of the principal source of contamination whatsoever. 24% involve only token treatment or treatment it's acknowledged to be ineffective by the agency itself. 8% of the sites, or 6 out of the 75, reflect a credible attempt to institute a permanent remedy to the maximum extent practicable. The cleanup standards and the extent to which the record process governs cleanups and natural resource damages will be the subject of Mr. Early and Mr. Wolf's testimony. But they, too, reflect nothing more than an ad hoc process and only a passing attempt to address these principal elements of the statute. Now, in sitting back, we began to assess what is the cause of this problem? Is it indeed the statute? Is it too vague? Is there just a learning curve problem in that people are trying to learn a new process? Or is there a fundamental problem with the leadership? Our conclusion, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bliley, is that it is difficult to imagine a statute having more clarity in terms of a change direction, a, a, a move toward permanent remedy and permanent protection of public health than, than the 1986 reforms. It is difficult to imagine statute having massively more funding than the Superfund program currently has. 
But what we have before us is the epitome of, of a program that is muddling through with a leadership team that apparently believes we're back in 1981. Mr. Chairman, something is seriously wrong when three years of effort re reflect no visible change in, in the cleanup patterns at Superfund sites. Something is also seriously wrong when EPA headquarters knows less about the patterns of cleanup decisions than we here sitting at this table, the potential responsible parties for these Superfund sites, or the Office of Technology Assessment and its outside reviewing panel. We believe that the statute is sound, Mr. Chairman, but is the, is the victim of failed leadership leadership that apparently fundamentally disagrees with the statutory changes enacted in 1986, that both passively allows 10 EPA regions to fend for themselves, and that actively undermines EPA regional decisions when permanent remedies have been selected. Now, the impact of this leadership vacuum, if you will, is twofold. There's a, there's a fundamental failure to institute permanent remedies to protect public health, and there's also a fundamental undermining of the decision-making process itself. We recognize this program is always going to involve a level of discretion and a level of flexibility unlike many other environmental programs. And we wholeheartedly agree, certainly with Chairman Dingell's call for an end to this Superfund shell game, but so too we identify with Congress and Lent's concerns as articulated in, in the floor statements that you must avoid expending massive volumes of dollars on low-level contaminated soil. But frankly, members of the committee, what we see in the 1987 cleanup decisions are not a series of marginal issues on which reasonable minds may differ. Rather, what we see is a statute that is being mangled by a management team that is indifferent at best and at times is malevolent. How can this agency purport to be instituting permanent remedies and following national cleanup goals when submerged landfills are allowed to be capped, when, quote, treatment technologies are used that the agency admits will fail, when we spend $35 million on making organic mud pies out of 50 percent oil contaminated soil? When the agency establishes a removal level of, quote, visible contamination for a colorless, odorless chemical such as PCBs, when it deliberately inflates the cost of a treatment option by 15-fold in order to reject it, when it asks residents to, quote, voluntarily abandon their wells but alternative water is not supplied, when, mace, when waste is merely redisposed into unlined pits delaying the day of reckoning, when technologies are frankly rejected as being too costly before bids are even submitted, and lastly, when organic contamination is ignored at a site because it's believed to be due to, quote, airplane overflight. You know, similarly, how can a management team at EPA claim that it's committed to the goals of permanent remedy and citizen access to the process when the National Contingency Plan amendments to implement the law, which were supposed to be final in April, have not even been proposed in June? When technical assistance grants to assist citizens in reviewing records of decision have not even been issued? When EPA headquarters, frankly, cannot even locate cannot even locate, Mr. Chairman, many of the records of decision for FY87 and to try to get the RIFS is, 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 uh, is, was even more difficult. There's, when, when there's no EPA headquarters oversight or coordination to ensure consistency between the regions, when the only guidance that Dr. Porter, the assistant administrator for the program, issues is a paltry three-page memo of nine co-equal criteria that fail to stipulate the relation between them or the preeminence of the pr permanent remedy directive, and lastly, when Dr. Porter in one of his few program initiative actively intervenes to scold the EPA regions for selecting treatment technologies too frequently. Now, I know some people have painted this program as one that has fallen victim to sort of passive neglect, to a lack of attention to detail, to a lack of aggressive management. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bliley, uh, we're here to tell you this morning that frankly the program problems go much deeper than just a, pa a, a passive um, director. Frankly, I would, it goes, there has been active intervention to undermine the directives and the aims of the statute. I'm releasing this morning a document that we've obtained through a Freedom of Information Act request, which was an interview with Dr. Porter and the uh, Office of Inspector General back on August 20, 1987. We'll provide copies for the record, but I'd like to summarize it very briefly here this morning. Uh, on August 20th, or in, in early August, Mr. Uh, Porter met with Lee Thomas and brought to him his uh, grave concerns the fact that the Superfund site cleanup remedies recently proposed by EPA and Region 6 in particular involve the use of, quote, expensive incinerators. According to the transcript, Dr. Porter stated that other EPA regions have begun to propose incineration as the remedy of choice. Transcript goes on to say that Dr. Porter stated that the perception of incineration as the best choice remedy is not only a Region 6 issue and considered this a serious concern. 
when he was asked by the interviewers how, how we should go about making decisions in this program, how decisions are made, Dr. Porter responded as follows. He handed the interviewers an index card with his nine fabled criteria on it with, and stated that's how we go about making remedies in this program. But Mr. Chairman, Mr. Blotley, that's what we have in this program. We have management by index card. We have, we have just, and that's just about as much guidance as the EPA regions have received, about as much as you can put on an, an index card. We have 10 EPA regions operating with nine co-equal criteria under, under the motto of have it your way. Now that may be fine for Burger King, but that should not be the motto of the Superfund program. I also want to bring to the committee's attention problem, an, an additional element of, of the sort of maligned or the, uh, the improper leadership of this program at EPA that occurred only last Thursday. The Office of Policy Analysis, uh, under the leadership of Mr. Dick Morgenstern, conducted a seminar entitled Toxic Treatments, or Toxic Sediments, I should say, Approaches to Management. This seminar was conducted for the purpose of establishing cleanup approaches to many of the contaminated harbors and waterways addressed by the Superfund program, including the Upper Hudson River, New Bedford, Massachusetts, Waukegan Harbor in Illinois, the Port of New York in New Jersey, Puget Sound, and the Sullivan Ledge Site in Region 1. What was the purpose of this conference? The purpose of this conference ostensibly was to determine what the most effective way and what the proper approach should be to cleaning up the contaminated harbor sites, many of which have PCBs, uh, under the Superfund program. While it was acknowledged that toxic sediments are a growing threat to drinking water, while the New Bedford situation had already shown PCBs creeping into the outer harbor, and while 184 other sites have been identified that contain toxic sediments, I will give the committee one guess as to what the recommended remedy was of Mr. Morgenstern. It was not to land dispose the sediments. It was not to treat it in, site, in situ. It was not to involve and in, engage in some form of phase separation, but rather the action alternative was no action at all. Leave the sediments there. That's the type of leadership we have in this program at, at this point, Mr. Chairman. We have a, a, essentially an absentee landlord in the form of Dr. Porter, who is, who is allowing the program to muddle through and we have essentially a slumlord in the form of Mr. Morgenstern who's taking his cut and putting nothing back into the maintenance of the program. It is clear that these ad hoc series of decisions cannot continue if the program is to succeed, if the program is not to be set back, as, as the chairman identified in his opening statement. We must essentially make the agency reflect the changes of the statute in the upcoming National Contingency Plan amendments if this program is to have a chance of succeeding, and we urge this committee to continue its vigorous oversight of that process. We'll have a series of recommendations to, to issue after Mr. Early and Mr. Wolf complete their, complete their presentations. Thank you. Well, we'll list you as undecided, Mr. Fortuna, about the effectiveness of the program. Representing the uh, Sierra Club, Mr. Blake Early. Mr. Early. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, yeah, Mr. They Blyley. Just, they, they just get a free ride. I'm happy to be able to testify this morning on behalf of the Sierra Club. I think it's important to put these hearings in some perspective. The program we re review today was recreated by Congress after three years of long effort. Congress had to sort through a great many controversial uh, and complex issues. Obviously, one can expect that with a uh, program of this size and complexity. The result was a delicate compromise, but one which contained key strengthening changes that promised to the American people a bigger, more aggressive, and more protective super fund. This is a sound law that has great potential to address the worst of the hazardous waste problems that have been created by a dynamic industrial society. What our study shows is that after two years, the Superfund program is not realizing this potential. The program is bigger, no doubt, but its effectiveness is being sapped by program administrators who have either ignored or failed to grasp what Congress intended. When Congress was considering the revisions to Superfund, a major controversy centered uh, around the widespread belief that the remedies that were currently being selected were Band-Aid remedies, that all they were doing was deferring the hazardous waste problem for future generations to deal with. As a result, Congress required, passed legislation that required, in making decisions for cleanup, that, that EPA adopt remedies that meet the standards and criteria set by other pollution control laws, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Any remedy considered must first meet this goal before EPA could then compare the costs 
and they are mandated to select the most cost effective remedy that meets these goals. These goals are to apply even if they're not legally applicable as long as they provide public health and protection. Congress also, also authorized EPA in its decision making document, the record of decision, to apply waivers where its remedy cannot meet these goals. There are six specific waivers and EPA is directed to lay out the uh, circumstances under which it can not meet the goals and apply the waivers instead. The use of these standards and criteria as the basic cleanup goal is very important. These standards and criteria have been set after a rigorous uh, decision making process at the agency and public review. The adoption of these goals uh, was believed to cut out a lot of bickering and arguing over what cleanup level should be uh, attained and therefore reduce the time it would take to, to uh, identify a goal and move on to implementation. And finally, the adoption of these standards and criteria as cleanup goals uh, assured the American public that there would be greater uniformity in the amount of public health protection that was occurring. What our study has found is that uh, EPA routinely fails to set any cleanup goals whatsoever in its record of decision. Now this may be convenient because it's a lot easier to, to write a record of decision. You, you eliminate a uh, potentially um, controversial public review over, over what the, the cleanup goals are, but it clearly is outside the law. The most blatant example of uh, the problem of not including standards and criteria uh, as cleanup goals in the records of decision is the application of Safe Drinking Water Act uh, standards and criteria. Although Congress directs EPA to, uh, where possible, attain maximum contaminant level goals that are set under the Safe Drinking Water Act, these are particularly important with respect to cancer causing uh, pollutants. Only one record of decision for only one pollutant set the cleanup goal at the maximum contaminant level goal set under Safe Drinking Water Act. All the rest set different goals. Sometimes they met a, a, a less restrictive and less protective uh, goal set under the um, Safe Drinking Water Act called the maximum contaminant level. But only once was the MCLG, as it's referred to, uh, identified as the cleanup goal, which would maximize the protection of the, uh, of the com surrounding communities. More commonly, EPA, rather than using the standards and criteria, set cleanup goals based on a complex calculation of the risk posed by the contaminants at the site. This ad hoc goal setting process is the very manipulable process Congress sought to eliminate with its re re reforms that laid out the new way to set cleanup goals and to, and to identify uh, cleanup remedies. The risk assessment process is unreliable because it is highly dependent on the assumptions of exposure and toxicity that are used in the formula. Our study found that this yields widely varying cleanup goals. In addition, the risk assessment process is subject to manipulation by potential responsible parties who seek to lower the cost of cleanups. In fact, an internal EPA study found that risk assessments conducted by potentially responsible parties were inherently unreliable and several regions ha um, have decided to reject the use of them. And finally, the use of these complex risk assessments completely cu cuts out public review of the goal setting process because it is very, very difficult to understand and we, in fact we didn't find a record of decision that included the, r the risk assessment uh, formula that was used for setting the goals. The result has been, as a, as a result of EPA uh, departing from the prescriptions of Congress for setting uh, cleanup goals, we have found widely varying goals set in the records of decision. As you can see by chart one that's located in the back of my testimony, groundwater clean cleanup provided for benzene, a virulent carcinogen at Rose Township site, is more than 30 times lower than the allowable levels at the Haviland, New York site, and nearly 100 times lower than the levels of benzene to be left in the groundwater at the Otadi and Goss site. Levels of PCBs allowed to remain in the soil at 
Renora, New Jersey site compared with those at the Paramore site were 10 times lower, five parts per million versus 50. Why should citizens not believe that with these widely varying cleanup goals set at different sites, EPA is using the practical equivalent of a dartboard in setting cleanup levels at Superfund sites? This vast variability in cleanup goals has the potential of creating another monster. Central to the success of the Superfund program is for EPA to take legal action against potentially responsible parties after it has conducted the cleanup and recover the monies from the responsible parties so that it can then go on and clean up other Superfund sites. The wildly varying cleanup goals enable these potential responsible parties to challenge the validity of EPA's cleanup and thus escape liability for all or part of the cost. It is a well-known fact that law firms all across this country are utilizing today a computerized system that tracks every goal set at, in every record decision across the country. It's safe to say that law firms representing responsible parties across this country know far more about these cleanup goals than EPA itself does when it sits down at the negotiating table. We see this uh, inadequate and inconsistent cleanup remedy selection system contributing to the downfall of efforts to get those who are responsible for the Superfund mess to, to pay for the mess they've created. The Superfund program is truly a train that is out of control, charging down the wrong track. The current EPA leadership does not want to switch the train to the track prescribed by Congress. Can Congress switch the train back on track only with intensive oversight and constant prodding? Here we are eight years after passage of Superfund with an EPA that is making cleanup decisions outside the law, failing to adequately protect public health and the environment, and creating loopholes for toxic waste dumpers. I have no doubt that Dr. Porter will defend the current program on the basis that EPA is duty bound to utilize cost effective remedies. My view is that due to mismanagement, EPA is squandering public monies, squandering public health, and squandering the public trust. This is hardly cost effective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Early. Mr. Doug Wolf, attorney for the National Res Natural Resource Defense Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Rich and Blake have uh, given you the uh, bad news, and I'd like to start out with some good news, because NRDC does not agree with those who say that the Superfund statute cannot work. One thing that our report has told us is that there are some good EPA decisions out there, and this to us means that this is a statute that can be made to work if EPA has the will to do it. As this report explains, the 1986 amendments represent an attempt by Congress to learn from America's past hazardous waste mistakes. Thus, as we've already described, SARA requires EPA, unless one of six limited waivers can be made to apply, to choose cleanup strategies that permanently eliminate the toxic hazards at a site in question. Although the vast majority of EPA's 1987 cleanup decisions ignore this requirement, and the waivers as well, at the Rose Township site in Michigan, EPA Region 5 decided to incinerate 50,000 cubic yards of contaminated soil, correctly reasoning that this type of permanent destruction is what the statute requires. This is despite the fact that most decisions reject as too costly using permanent cleanup technologies for even small amount of contaminated soil. A site in North Carolina rejected incineration for only 6,000 cubic yards. Another example of how EPA can and did make sound cleanup decisions is, th is the Resolve site in Massachusetts. The cleanup technology chosen, an innovative chemical dechlorination process, should permanently reduce the toxicity and volume of the contaminants at the site. And in marked contrast to all other cleanup decisions in 1987, EPA Region 1 plans to restore damaged natural resources surrounding the Resolve site. While these cleanup decisions are not exemplary in all respects, they stand head and shoulders above the other cleanup plans EPA approved in 1987, and they show that good decisions can be made under the Superfund program. EPA can make this program work if it uses the decision-making process Congress wrote into the statute in 1986. Now for some bad news. An important aspect of the 1986 Superfund amendments is the requirement that EPA look to applicable or relevant and appropriate 
standards from other environmental laws, including RCRA, in designing Superfund cleanups. We conclude that the majority of the 1987 cleanup decisions required land disposal remedies which do not comply with RCRA. This is particularly important as it is through the RCRA program that we have learned how risky land disposal of hazardous waste is and how to best safeguard against these dangers. Both the minimum technology design standards for land disposal and the land disposal ban have been given little attention by EPA, even though, as EPA has predominantly chosen land disposal containment remedies, these requirements should have been integral to each of these remedial designs. Unless EPA rethinks its decision making and follows the relevant standards from RCRA, these containment remedies will fail and we will continue to see the toxic shell game that this Congress tried to eliminate in 1986. This report also concludes that EPA has largely ignored impacts of hazardous contaminants upon fish and wildlife, even though its mandate is to protect both human health and the environment. And even if EPA wishes to misread the statute and only focus on human health, it has generally failed to consider the fact that fish and wildlife collect contaminants in their bodies and thus constitute a threat to the many Americans who eat fish and wild game. To conclude, our overwhelming conclusion is that EPA's implementation of the 1986 amendments has been a failure. However, the Superfund program can succeed and the report released today describes its few isolated successes. NRDC will work with its co-authors, this committee and EPA to put Superfund on the right track so that the 1,000 sites already on the list and the new sites EPA is about to announce will get the cleanups the American public expects and they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wolf. Our next witness will be Mr. Thomas Grumbly, President of Clean Sites Incorporated. Mr. Grumbly, yes, could I ask you to take that? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And now could I ask you to turn it on? Mr. Chairman, members of the thank subcommittee, you. thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to testify today. I'd like to have my entire testimony entered in the record and would like to summarize, uh, summarize it for you at this time. Without objection, each of the witnesses' complete testimony will be made part of the, uh, the complete hearing transcript and uh, the gentleman may proceed as he sees fit. Thank you very much. My name is Tom Grumbly. I'm president of Clean Sites Incorporated, a not-for-profit corporation established by a consortium of industry, government, and environmental leaders in 1984. Our job is to try to work primarily with the private sector to accelerate the pace of hazardous waste cleanup. Thus far, we've worked at about 40 hazardous waste sites and have helped get about 18 settlements. We're funded from three sources. 40% comes from fees that we get at the, the various sites that we work at. Those come from Fortune 500 companies, as well as the school districts, churches, hospitals, industrial launderers, and small businesses around the country who are involved in this problem. 50% of, of, of our support come from contributions from over 100 industrial and service corporations and the last 10 percent from national and local foundations. My organizational interest is straightforward. It's to, great, it's to get more private party cleanup voluntarily involved in this situation. Accordingly, if SARA succeeds as I read it, clean sites will succeed. In the next few minutes, I want to summarize my view of what you and your colleagues did in SARA and how the law relates to EPA's ability to implement it, say a few words about the successes EPA has had, lay out some remaining problems and propose some tentative ideas for solutions. With respect to the law, we at Clean Sites believe that it's our job to try to get the current law to work as best as it can. Even though we think there will be and perhaps should be some continuing debate over whether the current law permits us to focus our societal resources adequately on the worst problems, we fundamentally think you passed a law that should be workable and that was appropriate to the enormous magnitude of the problem. We also think that the EPA has and will continue to have a difficult time implementing the law successfully because you've asked the EPA to do some things institutionally that run against some of the things they're most successful at. EPA is at its best when it can spend appropriated money directly to implement a single national regulatory standard and then get the regions or the headquarters to enforce the standard in a uniform way. The inherently local nature of Superfund and the taxation mechanism that you chose while appropriate to the problem cut against the culture of the EPA. We can see this problem, I think, in both the successes and the problems of the program. And despite the drumbeat of criticism, I think that there are some successes. As you indicated in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, EPA will meet the specific quantitative targets and deadlines for preliminary assessments and site investigations. Second, the EPA has now published guidance on all the new provisions identified in SARA. <clears throat> 
The guidance on mixed funding, covenants not to sue, alternative dispute resolution, and others have gone reasonably well. If there are major problems, it's with the de minimis guidance, and I think this stems from a problem that EPA always has, that is, the desire to treat all parties equally, even when the distinctions are sometimes structured into the statute for legitimate ends. Third, the EPA has done a good job at initiating RIFSs, undertaking removal actions, and settling cases where only one or a very few parties are involved. And, not trivially, given the past history of the program, the agency is at least obligating the Superfund. I will argue in a minute that overly free use of the fund ultimately works against the success of the cleanup program. It's understandable, however, that EPA should want to overcome this past criticism. Fourth, the agency is improving its ability to gather and communicate information to potentially responsible parties in a timely way so that PRPs can better negotiate among themselves about the allocation of responsibility. And fifth, and I think very significantly, I don't believe that the current program is being run for partisan political purposes. And I think this is an important point, again, given the history of the program. It should give us a strong professional base for improving the program over the next 40 months, both at the end of this administration and into the next administration, whichever party that will be. The facts are, however, that EPA cannot continue to implement the law as it has in the last 20 months and expect that the program will accomplish its goals. Everyone knew that the original $8.5 billion in the fund would only accomplish remediation at some of the sites. Significant cost recovery and private party cleanup would be necessary to get remediation underway at the 951 MPL sites that existed at that time. This cost recovery and private party participation is not happening at anywhere near the necessary rate to achieve cleanup. There are two general reasons for this, we believe. First, even though the tools you provided the agency are appropriate to the problem, the EPA is not comfortable using all those tools, particularly the enforcement and cost recovery tools. And secondly, we are not using, even within the available uh, statutory framework, the available scientific tools to get the best cleanups at the places where they can do the most good. Several specifics can be cited. First, by the agency's own admission, cost recovery and suits against recalcitrant non-settlers at large multi-party sites have been minimal. In particular, the thoughtful use, and I emphasize that, that word thoughtful, the thoughtful use of Section 106 orders to clean up has not happened. To take thoughtful, prudent action against recalcitrants requires more effort than the direct use of the Superfund. And unless one changes the incentives that face agency employees out in the field, we're not likely to see a major change. But without a credible enforcement program by the EPA, the private sector simply will not step forward voluntarily. The use of the Superfund directly is easy, and one can see why EPA officials opt for the fund. But complete reliance on the fund potentially freezes cleanup. If companies come forward to settle and then see their colleagues at a site able to hide in the weeds, they will not step forward again. Not only are they treated with what one agency official has called a shoot the volunteers attitude, but their competitors get a direct financial advantage. We must change this dynamic if we want more voluntary participation. Third, the agency has not used the mixed funding provisions to the extent intended either by the Congress nor to the extent intended by the administrator. There have only been three mixed funding settlements so far. Fourth, the decision process in Superfund is simply too slow. We must try to speed it up. Fifth, the de minimis guidance and the technical assistance grant regulations seem both too rigid and controlling. In the first case, the agency seems not to be anxious to let truly small parties out, probably because they are trying to avoid bad precedents with large companies who may be, quote, de minimis at a lot of sites. In the technical assistance grant case, EPA seems really not persuaded that citizens can help the process if they get in early and with good assistance. Most fundamentally, Mr. Chairman, there seems to be a disconnect between much stated policy and implementation. It may be that this is due to the lack of an understood, coherent strategy within the government for how to make SARA a success. The lack of a national contingency plan at this time highlights the rather fundamental nature of this problem. With respect to science, there are obviously continuing disputes inside the government. One only need read the OTA report and between the government and all parties over the adequacy of remedy selection. We can really not fairly evaluate such charges until and unless the objective scientific and technical community is able to become more actively involved in a hands-on way in the process. The Congress settled the how clean is clean issue legally by giving the government the last word. It is really not clear, however, whether the issue has been settled within the broader republic of science, that is, within the scientific and technical community of the nation. It must ultimately be resolved there if the agency is to retain its credibility. 
It's always easier to criticize than to propose constructive practical change. It does seem clear that EPA must adapt some of its ideas and strategies to the tools you have given it. Because the single most important tool is the Superfund itself, it's critical to spay, pay special attention to how that fund is used, both directly and in the kinds of incentives and disincentives its use entails for the private sector. Even though the law gives all final authority to the government, it is both prudent and necessary to create a more constructive dynamic within the private community. This is not to say that anyone deserves favored treatment or sweetheart deals. To the contrary, success at the number of sites we are talking about requires the massive infusion of private sector money. To make this happen, we must have a coherent strategy that balances the use of the Superfund in the most appropriate cases with the judicious and visible use of the enforcement tools you have given the agency. The thoughtful mix of carrots and sticks, fund and enforcement will elicit private party participation because you will change the economic dynamic within the private sector. It's not clear to me that such a strategy can be developed solely within the executive branch, even though the law makes it the responsibility of the president to propose the national contingency plan. A true NCP will only be developed if all interested parties are included in a process that people will trust. Such a plan needs to be on the table in time for early consideration by the next administration. Our experience leads me to suggest that some of the following ideas need to be seriously considered. First, cost recovery needs to be dramatically increased. Second, mixed funding and more visible action against recalcitrant parties needs to be pursued even during the next six months. Third, the full use of the Superfund should be tied to real achievement in enforcement. The agency should consider keeping fund money in reserve to reward regions that make visible progress on enforcement. To do this adequately requires that the entire $1.6 billion be appropriated every year. More can be done even within the current statutory framework to ensure that regions apply the most stringent remedies to those sites that present the worst health and environmental risks. Headquarters must improve the scientific and technical information that reaches the field. Fifth, EPA needs to personalize more clearly responsibility for cleanup and reward achievement. This can be done, I guarantee you, within the current civil service system, but it will require concerted attention by you with the Office of Personnel Management to make that happen. Sixth, the command and control structure between regions and headquarters needs to be dramatically improved. Much decision making must be done at the regions if the number of sites we envision are to be dealt with. However, there must be much stronger authority links between the assistant administrators in Washington and the regions. Currently, it seems that the headquarters has the ability to stamp its feet, but not really very much more. Accordingly, the current regional structure of EPA is ill-adapted to the local decision making process that Superfund requires. Seventh, the de minimis guidance and the technical assistance grant regulations need to be implemented for their clear intent. In the first case, to permit differences to be recognized within the overall joint and several structure, and the latter to remove control of a piece of the process to the community where the Congress intended it. Eight, we need to consider whether the current delisting concept is really the best definition of success we want under Superfund. Some of our best cleanups require continuing action, even those using the most advanced technology and monitoring that may preclude delisting. Some communities, in fact, may be happier with the continued presence of the government rather than simply coming in, taking action, and leaving things to chance for the future. And finally, we need to find new tools to bring the EPA and the rest of the community together on the scientific evaluation of site problems and on the use of new technology. The EPA sites program is undoubtedly one way, but we must find other ways to get EPA, industry, environmental, and academic scientists interacting before views get locked into place. In essence, we need to foster the development of a scientific and technical guild around which site-related problems can be discussed, but without reducing in any way the authority of EPA to make decisions. We need to create room for scientists to come to consensus, which they do more often than not, really, when confronted by data, before we let the legalisms and the process push them apart. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, none of these ideas are, of course, magic bullets. Lee Thomas is right when he calls the program a major management challenge. But there are several reasons why we must meet this challenge. Superfund presents a classic challenge to those of us who view government as more than a necessary evil. We have the epitome of a situation in which public expectations have been dramatically raised. The government must demonstrate that it is competent to deal with these expectations if we are to expect our citizenry to listen to us in the future. We cannot let the cup pass on the grounds that the problem is too hard or that the risks are not as great as we originally thought. 
I believe that the public is going to look at Superfund as a litmus test of whether the government is serious about being able to manage involuntary risk in our society. If we fail, we will have much greater difficulty in the future implementing programs about other and perhaps greater risks. This is the largest concentrated application of resources ever made in the world to an environmental problem. We must make Superfund work during the next three years or face the harsh judgment of our neighbors, our friends, and yes, even our constituents. But we cannot simply pound the table. We must understand the problems the EPA has and propose practical solutions to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Grumbly. Our uh, final witness on this panel is Mr. William A. Wallace, Director of Hazardous Waste Management at CH2M Hill, one of the nation's largest contractors in this area. Mr. Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bliley. Uh, I'm director of CH2M Hill's Hazardous Waste Management Program. And let me, before I begin my formal testimony, describe briefly what CH2M Hill is. We're the fifth largest consulting engineering firm in the country and have a staff of over 3,500 employees at over 50 offices worldwide. We're a bit unusual in that we're entirely employee-owned. I understand the purpose today of your hearings is to examine the implementation of SARA and methods to improve and expedite the remedial investigation feasibility study process. We believe we're well qualified to deal in this subject because we've to date completed or are still working on over five, uh, 100 RIFS projects for the EPA, other government agencies, and the private sector. Uh, let me begin by summarizing and commenting on the, some of the past witnesses. I feel coming into this hearing that I'm uh, observing a bunch of blind men looking at the elephant here. As a technical person, we've been very cognizant of all of the problems and the scheduling that's gone on uh, with the RIFS program, the issues coming up about how well we're handling the scheduling. I think we, from our perspective, have brought two, today two important breakthroughs in our understanding of the problems of hazardous waste remediation. First, I think we've discovered the fundamental reason why it's taking so long to clean up hazardous waste sites, which we've traced to a basic flaw in our understanding of the site contamination problem the capabilities of the technologies to deal with that. This problem is deeply rooted, as many of my colleagues in the stand have said, to enormous uncertainty present at these sites. And insofar as we have this insight, we've devised a different method now for handling hazardous waste sites, which to me is a rational basis, finally, for handling this huge uncertainty that have not yet recognized. It's adaptable to the RIFS process, and may offer substantial savings in time and cost and certainly the getting some progress going on these pilot testing with EPA and with other uh, clients of ours at this method at some hazardous waste sites and this testimony I'm about to give you will further amplify what the problems are. First, let me explain some of these ideas with, I'm going to have use the charts that are over on the, uh, to your right um, and I'll have to use my colleague Dick Corrigan, who's here from our Washington, D.C. office. And we have copies of uh, printed copies of each of these charts that you're, you're showing. Most to of the them, committee. and to the extent we have extra, we'll provide extras also. Thank you very much. First, uncertainty is the pivotal issue in this whole process. We can't begin a remedy without completely understanding the uncertainty, and that is the risk to public health. <coughs> Let me begin by showing how these, some of these sites are remedied and begin with our initial understanding. We don't know anything about a site coming in. We may suspect there's some problem since I've represented that fairly blank opening, uh, beginning understanding. Next, we use our best technology now to look at these sites. We may see through the use of boreholes into the subsurface, uh, the understanding there be may be many various layers there. We may find some contamination, as we've tried to indicate on the, on the right side mm -hmm. of the chart. We find where groundwater was. Then our technology that we have right now, next slide, Dick, we start to characterize the site, and we draw various layers across there. That's the typical kind of study that's done at these, and notice we're trying to characterize and showing where layers leave off. These are the sorts of things one looks at when one tries to figure out where contamination may be and how fast it may migrate. The next slide, though, is what our, we really may be facing, which is a chaotic element. The full picture of what a site may look like may be quite different. They show different layers that we hadn't even been able to discern, different cracks in the rock, different contaminants we may not have found. And this gets down to the seriousness of the issue. The issue is to find 
by the high risk to public health and the high cost of cleanup. Many of the preceding gentlemen have pointed to the fact that, yes, there's alternate technologies, but they're awfully expensive. And if we happen to misjudge just how we put one of these sites uh, into a remedial fashion, we may be in very difficult strait. It's also high risk to public health. And given that situation, many of the people who are dealing with these sites uh, are very concerned that, one, we may not have found all the contamination that may be there. We may not have plotted exactly where it goes, because the current technology simply will not allow us to do that. Uh, what we have done, and the flaw, is to not recognize the limits of our technology. If we were to calculate where all the significant contamination of waste might be at one of these sites, we would have to put so many boreholes in the ground as to honeycomb the site with holes to find if you will, of one or two drums that may be there that may cause problems later on. Our fallacy that I'm pointing out is that we thought going into this process that this engineering problem is just like all the traditional engineering problems we've had in the past, that it's a, somehow a study and design build approach. That if you study the site enough, if you put all the holes in the ground and find all the models, you'll eventually find all the significant contaminants and eventually estimate where they're going to go. That's patently false. And this gets complicated. What I want to point out now is how this might cause some delays. Remember, if you will, the risks are involved. We're talking about doing a remedy at a site where public health is involved. And there's lots of concern over the high cost of the remedy, and if we're wrong. And we get embroiled in this as a consultant, not only for the government, but for private industry as well. Now, what happens is, uh, to go to the next slide, Two more. <laughs> I try to express this in terms of residual risk. That is that on the y-axis, we have the risk that's reduced after the remedy is put in place versus the cost. And we all recognize that, yes, containment is not as good as others, but it's a little cheaper. That treatment is better than others, and it may be a little more expensive, and there's quite a bit of overlap. But the uncertainties that I'm pointing out, the uncertainties of knowing what the toxicology is, knowing how the waste, when we find them, might move through the site, knowing where other waste sites may be there that we didn't discover, leave a broad band of uncertainty and un misunderstanding of that residual risk. And so the process is delayed now through a game I cited as positioning for least cost, where all of us get involved. That includes the public, the response action contractors, EPA, and uh, the PRPs. They may, in pointing out how the mechanism might work, EPA may decide on treatment, which may pick a point on the very left side or right side of that graph. And go up to the top inset, Dick. Yeah. But again, that's very expensive. The PRP may decide, well, that's not appropriate, and we want to pick a point on the further to the left, maybe looking at more containment or a cheaper treatment option. The uncertainties inherent in this process let disputes go on forever. You, simply by studying the site and pointing out the uncertainties of the, uh, what the other party poses will let you continue to study the site on and on and on without having any kind of resolution. And this is all based on the fact that we simply cannot understand because of the limits of the technology, exactly what the toxicology might be, exactly where these wastes are, and exactly what might happen to them if we let them move about. And that's the risk we're facing, and it has to do with a lot of the elements of Superfund, just seemingly applied by a misunderstanding of what the technology is and how, we've met, how we try to put it forward. <coughs> Find it, that I think is all the charts we're gonna have. Other stalls that go on when we're dealing with the RIFS process seem to be in misunderstanding this, appro this approach or in misunderstanding what the limits of the technology are. We've got people that want to study these sites and want to come up with the right answer. That's so frustrating for me because we've got a number of people in this room and all of these different, representing all the different parts of the uh, government industry who all want to get the sites cleaned up. But the cost and the risk that's posed makes it awfully difficult to come up with a an agreement of what the right answer is. And unfortunately, all of these players are trying to get out of this for least cost. The EPA doesn't want to spend all of its resources on one or two sites. It's got the whole nation to clean up. P 
PRPs don't want to go bankrupt on a single site by it costing hundreds of millions of dollars. They want to get off for the cheapest way possible. For the same way, we don't want to go in and implement a remedy that is based on a study that's basically flawed because of this misunderstanding and not and then later get blamed for it when somebody finds this errant drum of waste that we missed out there. And that's the kind of thing we're facing. There's also what I call the technological gremlin that's part of these players who, in this great field of play with all of these different uncertainties and uh, knowledge or un not understanding the process, it's an awfully good opportunity to do lots of Monday morning quarterbacking as to what really the uh, remedy should have held or what, what we ought to have done here or there. And that's unfortunately uh, may make the press, but it's not particularly useful when it comes to moving forward at these sites. Now, my old boss once told me that anybody can find problems. The real tough thing is how to solve them. Now, we've come up with a new approach that starts to handle uncertainty, which is being tried at a number of sites. It's not the ultimate condition that uh, we're hoping to place there. It, it's, a, it's a trial, but at least it may get us going. And let me try to explain that. We've held some internal meetings recognizing that this is a problem and came up through our geotechnical engineers with an approach comes out of the geotechnical field called the observational method. It's about 40 years old, but it was recognized in the geotechnical field that dam design and other uncertainties of the subsurface were in fact a, a part of life, and we try to approach this in a different way. It will fit into the RAFS process and may in fact help out. Uh, the idea is that you gather information about what the problem might be, but you recognize that you're not going to come up with the ultimate answer. You're going to come up with a most probable model of what the site's like, and that's about as good as you're going to do. But, and the critical difference, is that you recognize that you have uncertainties, and you try to establish reasonable deviations to your model so that you understand, yes, this may be the approach we're going to take, but there are reasonable deviations that may occur out there. And what we would pose in the Superfund process now is to study to get a probable model and identify the reasonable deviations and stop there, not continuing to ultimately characterize the site to death or do something of, of that nature. When that is selected, we would go with a, forward with a remedy which is based on the probable model but has incorporated with it contingency plans that if our model wasn't correct, we can do something different. And we're measuring for those during the design and the remediation process. So by selecting in advance courses of action for this sort of thing, we can start moving ahead. Now, this may mean actually more time in RIFSs if it's difficult for us, recognizing the uncertainty and the critical issues of protecting public health and the environment and the cost of being wrong. We may work harder to find what the reasonable deviations are, and we may take longer to figure out what the most probable model is. On other sites, we found, particularly in the general groundwater contamination, that we have a limited success in coming up with uh, any particular great information during the investigation phase. We can sort of find out where the contamination is, but to look at the dynamics of the system when you start pumping or treating, those things are left on the side. You just cannot find that sort of thing out by digging little holes in the ground. You have to get a major production well going and find out then what happens in the system. So, there is a sense that we have that on certain problems we can get out there much faster because what we're actually doing is uh, figuring out that on certain sites that uh, a groundwater pump and treat system would actually work, which is our gut feel right now. Secondly, we would, after recognizing what the reasonable deviations are and accounting for those, we would start moving out on sites a little quickly. And we're trying this out right now at certain sites. There's also a factor which was alluded to that we now recognize, given the uncertainty, you want certain kinds of remedies that are better in dealing with uncertainty. In mathematics, this is called a feature of robustness, where robust solutions in mathematics are those that take care of a broader range of problems than they may have been originally designed. And for example, in the groundwater general contamination problem, pump and treat seems to be a very robust solution. If we missed one of those pots of waste over in the side there, we would be drawing it towards a pump, point of pump and treat as, it, as opposed to letting it meander around the site in a much chaotic fashion. And so we would think that adding that to some of the decision points are as important. It also explains why there's a lot of treatment activities out there that are postulated as, as new and, and innovative, which are not necessarily robust, and that's a problem. We cannot 
we need to look at that in terms of the uncertainty that's provided and programs like the site program may go a long way of figuring out just how well these different kinds of technologies will perform. We think this method offers much better protection of public health and environment than maybe what we're currently doing in that it accounts for the uncertainty. It doesn't allow us to go out believing we've found all of the spots of contamination and puts presumably wells in place or some sort of monitoring detail that will allow us to pick that up in the future. Uh, it's now being tried at several hazardous waste sites and we've also been, had this process has been recently discovered. It's been only about six months since we had our first meetings and discovered this process and since that time CH2M Hill has met with the Congress, EPA and about 25 groups and all parts of the public and private sector to discuss it and try to get some criticism. We think we've got a, no a good notion here and it needs to be tested but certainly it provides a way to start pr moving forward on these sites and devising a way to get out of a routine that postulates more and more study as opposed to something that closes the issue on study and, and starts to look at remedy. So Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the opportunity to express these views and I'd be glad to answer any questions later about it. Thank you, Mr. Wallace, and I thank each of our uh, witnesses for the uh, candor of their contributions to this. Gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Wallace, uh, some people have suggested that uh, Superfund cleanup plans should make use of treatment options whenever possible. Do you think soil which is contaminated that is not very mobile should always be treated? Not necessarily. I think in our look at this particular issue and the robust technologies, if there is certain kinds of contaminants that are not mobile then, and are very widespread and very deeply embedded in the ground such that they re represent a very large volume to incinerate or treat in some fashion and in so doing cause a very large cost to be spent on doing so, capping may be a good alternative. Now that the problem I get into in answering questions is that it's awfully easy to generalize and given the uncertainties there's a lot of things that we uh, are now being very s skeptical about saying but I think capping has a place particularly when we're trying to do something which is a reasonable expenditure of funds and if public health can be protected, that is putting enough monitoring wells around the site that if we were wrong, if our certainty about the mobility was wrong, that we'd be able to attack movement and be able to do something about it later. Uh, Mr. Wallace, you, you pointed out that uh, studies of Superfund sites could go on indefinitely that at some point someone has to choose some remedy and forge ahead. What is the effect of post-decision strident criticism on the wit willingness of EPA officials to stick their neck out and make future decisions? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding your question. What I'm saying is, is that you, you've pointed out that the, you need to, at some point, you study, you study, you study, uh, you've got to make a decision. What effect do you think that the possibility of post-decision strident criticism has on uh, EPA officials and their willingness or unwillingness to stick their neck out and make a decision? I see. I, I think they are in the same difficulty we are in making those decisions. The problem is that, as you've seen today, that decisions made because of the uncertainty will always, there's always a way to find an assumption that could be taken differently, a judgment that in hindsight could have been taken better that will be criticized by one or more parties. I think what I'm saying in this approach is that we simply recognize that there are huge uncertainties out there and do the best we can to account for them. Now, in the setting that you portrayed, Mr. Bliley, that is precisely what I believe is happening, that EPA believes that it has to harden up its decision-making on these sites to handle all of this criticism. And I am pointing out, hopefully today, to the people at, at this committee that this is not possible. The sites are always going to be uncertain, so therefore any decision that 
anyone makes, whether it be EPA or a PRP, is always subject to criticism. Because we haven't understood that this uncertainty is always going to be with us, it was presumed. I think the world believes that if you have these assertions that are made by others, you simply haven't studied the site enough, and that's absurd. What we need to do is recognize that uncertainty, and hopefully that will free up the point you're making about EPA, being very nervous and cautious about the criticism that it may get uh, because it finally selected a remedy, and that I think has a lot to do with, with why it's uh, difficult to move ahead at these sites. Mr. Wallace, you represent an engineering and consultant firm that does a great deal of Superfund work, as you pointed That's out. That's correct. Would you, or could you, for the benefit of the committee, briefly suggest a few alternative ways to perform remedial investigations and, and feasibility studies more, more expeditiously? Well, I think the one that comes to mind that I was trying to represent on the board is, is by using this recognition of the uncertainty and an observational-like method. What we would do on a site, to go to the um, points that I was raising before, is to begin a study which tries to identify generally where the contamination is, generally what the site looks like, generally its hydrogeologic and geologic conditions, so we understand the, where the most of the waste might be and, and what kind of subsurface setting it, it resides in. We would then start looking at alternatives that may be appropriate for this uh, type of site or may not and be able to start screening those. We would ultimately come up with enough information to start converging on one of those remedies, not to the point where we've totally designed it to a fare thee well and have all of the changes that may take place all handled, but rather to a point where we understand that there is a bunch of engineering decisions we, we may need to take later. Or that, at that point, we would pose a record of decision that says, this site is uncertain. I think that has to be understood at every site. We say the best we've done right now is to understand that this is the probable model that we are going to use to design our remedy. These are the logical uncertainties there, the, the downsides, the errors that we could, something we could be missing. And here's how we've handled those. And go forward with that kind of record. In that situation, we now have a way to go, a movement forward, a bunch of contingency plans that if we were wrong, we can make those changes along the way and we can start going forward. Now, in the process of remediation, we would simply start moving ahead with, with the design that we selected on the most appropriate one, followed up by a uh, contingency plans that may have to be invoked if we find something different. And our the people out on the site would be not only digging or pumping or whatever happens to be appropriate or, or incinerating and, and whatever treatment technology is selected, but looking at other deviations to that. If we were pumping a well, for instance, one of our major deviations might be finding a slug of material that we never expected. There's ways to design around that so that if somebody is detecting that, then we route the material down to another spot and may do something else with it. All of these things can be done in an engineering fashion. The major difficulty we have is the belief by many that this thing follows the normal engineering practice where by the time you get to design, you've hardened it up to a point where there's no change and uh, there is nothing that, if, if there is change, then it must be the fault of somebody by not studying enough. And that, I think, is the prime difference in the way we would approach a site. Mr. Fortuna, I understand that uh, you have found instances of where soil can be incinerated for a cost of $175, $180 a ton. Uh, other figures have been offered uh, on, that are on the magnitude of $300 to $400 a cubic yard. How do you account for the difference? What have we presented in the report in, uh, in Chapter 2, uh, Section 3, was a range of costs that are currently, that reflect current bids, current uh, jobs that have been secured for those prices. The Prentice site in, in uh, southeastern United States in Mississippi, I believe, is the one where that I quote the $176 a ton figure for. I think it's significant to note that that is only on a job of 7,500 tons. Uh, the additional 2,000 tons would be, would be burned for the price of $121 a ton. That, that is cheaper than most forms of, of, uh, of record quality land disposal today. There are other sites in the southeast from some of our other non-member firms that are in that same range. The difference in cost, I think, really reflect a, a, an inverse sliding scale of volume. If you only have one or 2,000 tons or, or a lower volume of material to, to incinerate, 
then you're going to have prices probably upwards of $300 to $450 a ton. Where you have some of the larger volume sites uh, involved, where you have upwards of 5,000 tons, that's where you get your economies of scale for the most part, and, and you get uh, $250 to, to $125 per ton charges. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Grumley, you mentioned that uh, EPA has not been using mixed funding settlements very often. In your view, is this because EPA has been unwilling to use the fund on behalf of parties who are unknown, insolvent, or similarly, similarly unavailable, as opposed to using it on behalf of those who refuse to settle? Well, I think, first of all, there, there have only been three settlements at the mixed funding settlements at this point, so it may be too soon to ask the questions exactly why they haven't been willing to use this, this that, or the other. It seems clear to me that when you all passed the law, the conference report said that the Superfund should be spent on orphan shares. So I would expect to see that over time, that as we enter into mixed funding settlements, that we will get some of that kind of uh, action. Thus far, that hasn't happened. You represent an organization, Mr. Grumley, uh, that has had a great deal of experience with the EPA. In your opinion, uh, what grade would you assess for the EPA based on its performance during this uh, period? Um, I, I guess I view myself as a student at this session, and you being the <laughs> teachers, uh, I'd, I'd rather have you give the, uh, the, the actual grade. Uh, I went to school back during the 1970s when we were into fail, pass, um, all those kinds of things. I think how about, that. How about incomplete? <laughs> uh, that's fair enough, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Bliley. Uh, uh, Mr. Fortuna, uh, I want to thank, uh, I want to give the thanks of the committee to, uh, to you uh, and your, for your efforts here, but I. I guess uh, Ms. Greer is the person to whom I should direct a, a very specific question, if, if I may. And uh, uh, your report analyzed the remedy selection for a particular site in my district, Laskin, uh, Laskin Poplar Oil. In reading your report, I noticed that the Laskin rod got very high marks uh, for consideration of RICRA land disposal ban and for doing a significant amount of incineration. I, I guess several, 700,000 gallons of various sludges were, were incinerated. Uh, but it got a very low remark, if I understand uh, uh, correctly, uh, because the PCB cleanup level established for removal, and I'm quoting from your report now, uh, were an objective numerical standard. They used the standard of visibly contaminated areas as opposed to uh, a standard where an objective numerical standard should have been uh, implemented. Uh, at what time did the, at one time did the rod or feasibility study contain a numerical standard to the best of your knowledge yeah we, we reviewed both the rod and the responsiveness summary which comes after the rod in the responsiveness summary it was implied that originally the cleanup standard had been set for five parts per million in soil which given the range we've seen of from five to fifty that was a reasonably low um, cleanup number furthermore in the rod they cite um, various authorities, I think it was ASTDR, although I'm not exactly sure, saying that from one to five parts per million in soil of PCBs was a safe level of exposure. It appears from the discussion in the responsiveness survey that it was after that um, decision on the level of cleanup that EPA discussed the cleanup with the responsible parties and an agreement was reached to change the cleanup goal to visibly contaminated soil. That is how it appears in the responsiveness summary um, appended to the rod. And it is clear from the rod that now the goal is visible contamination, which as we point out in our report is ludicrous given the fact that PCBs are both invisible and have no smell. It really seems that it will be an arbitrary amount of soil dug up rather than any decision based on protection of human health and the environment. How does the Laskin standard of uh, visibly contaminated areas, I guess is the, the exact words they use, compare with the PCB cleanup levels at uh, at other sites or similarly situated sites in the in the yeah, country. Yeah, we saw we saw saw a range there. Um, as as Blake indicated in Renora, New Jersey, they picked five parts per million. Um, that was the low. That was the low. We had in Rose Township, Michigan, ten parts per million. We have in Resolve, Massachusetts, twenty-five parts per million. But there, EPA did. Um, invoke a feasibility concern, an engineering feasibility concern of the level. So they did not really state that 25 parts per million was safe. There was um, 
PCBs um, ignored basically at anything up to 50 parts per million at one site in, in Florida called the Paramore Surplus. We did have quite a range then in what EPA had identified as a safe level of cleanup. Of well, what's going on here? Soils. Is this Wheel of Fortune? I mean, uh, spin the <laughs> wheel, pick a number? Yeah, it, it does seem to be that. Can I you mean, explain to me any substantive, scientific, uh, uh, geological impossibility? Can you explain to me? why that grave variation, uh, that, that, that seeming l broad level of inconsistency uh, exists? Is there a reason well, for Well, I think that the best explanation is to look at another chemical where we did have a little bit more information on how the levels were set and where, again, the levels were extremely variable. That chemical is lead, another chemical common to the ears of the American public and well known, well documented for the health hazards that it poses. Um, in lead, we had a range of concentrations from, um, let's see, um, 14 parts per million to 100 parts per million in soil. And 14, there, to 14 to 100. Okay. There we could trace in the records of decision the exposure assumptions that were made and that differed substantially from site to site and that therefore led to different numbers. And the examples are quite startling. For example, at the Rose Township site, once again, we had a level of 70 parts per million. And that was higher than at the Schmaltz dump in Wisconsin, where the level was 14 parts per million. In reading the explanation, it turns out that at Rose Township, the EPA assumed that no child under three would come into contact with the contaminated soil for the reasons that this child would always be under constant adult supervision. Uh, something that caused me Federally to Federally financed daycare at the site, <laughs> in other words. <laughs> exactly. On the other hand, the 14 part per million level was selected on the assumption that a child would come into contact with one gram of soil per day. There we have an example where it, it boiled down to substantial differences in the exposure assumptions for the sites, not really based on science at all, but based on kind of a dartboard kind of hit, hit the target. We had a similar... What would um, be a, an acceptable level of exposure if that, if that could be asserted for, for lead at, at these sites? Well, I'm afraid that I haven't picked an acceptable level for lead. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, I think we were focusing more on the range and the fact that the range existed undermining EPA's statements that all remedies are protective. You know, it's, it seems impossible to me that all remedies can be equally protective where there's that kind of range in contaminants selected for... Did you for find safety. any reason in your examination of the vagaries of these numbers that would justify why one would be higher or lower than the other? No, I didn't. I found some excuses, but none of them seemed reasonable to me. Were, they, were the vagaries explained in the, in the records of decision? No. In fact, as has been a point that has been made earlier today, um, the risk assessments are extremely poorly documented in most of these records of decision, such that you really cannot trace the way that the agency reached the number. In some cases, of course, we have no number at all. But even where the numbers are given, there is very little there upon which to trace um, their decision making. Mr. Fortuna, one of the points uh, I believe Mr. Wallace was making dealt with cost effectiveness something that uh, continues to come up on a recurring basis uh, before a wide variety of committees and a, a, a number of issues. Our 1986 amendment report, the conference report in this section, says as follows. The term cost effective means that in determining the appropriate level of cleanup, the president first determines the appropriate level of environmental and health protection to be achieved and then selects a cost efficient means of achieving that goal. It is clearly a two-step process. Only after the president determines, the report goes on to say, by the selection of applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements that adequate protection of human health and the environment will be achieved, is it appropriate to consider cost effectiveness, end of quote of, of the report. From your analysis now of the work that, that you have done, is the agency following the, the clear expressed intent of Congress and what guidance has gone to the regions on the cost effectiveness issue? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that was one of the key criteria that we and our members looked at as well as the other members of our team. And frankly, it's just business as usual. Uh, the, the fundamental flaw that the 1986 law tried to change was the emphasis early on that you just choose the least cost technologically achievable method, which always turned out to be land disposal. That has simply fundamentally not changed. The agency is not looking to establish a level of a
that the 1986 law tried to change was the emphasis early on that you just choose the least cost technologically achievable method, which always turned out to be land disposal. That has simply fundamentally not changed. The agency is not looking to establish a level of effectiveness that is protective and reflects permanence, but is simply looking again at spending the least money that it can at each site. That fundamental change that the conference report echoes is not in evidence. Uh, and I think it's, it is, it, that is probably one of the most significant failings. Not only is cost being allowed to continue to be the dominant factor, but moreover, EPA is using outdated uh, and inaccurate cost information and is frankly failing to take, uh, take advantage of uh, what, uh, to use one of Mr. Wallace's terms, the robust competition in the remedial marketplace at the present time. Yeah. The Prentice site that I responded to on Mr. Blarley's question had nine different final bidders, uh, all submitting uh, uh, bids for, for the incineration of 7,500 tons of contaminated material. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the site in Mr. Florio's district, the Bridgeport Owen Rental Site, 150 different people showed up last week at a, at a, uh, at a, at a, a bidder's meeting to, for EPA to begin laying out the criteria under which bids would be accepted. The competition in this field, in the remedial services field right now, is robust and as pitched as it can be. The agency is frankly just continuing to rely on both the data of the past and practice of the past and is failing to take advantage of that in terms of achieving permanence for, it, for the equivalent cost of land disposal today. If, if I could jump in here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Early, please. One of the things that I noted, if, if you recall during the, uh, the debate of, of Sarah, um, one of the major points that was raised is that in its Band-Aid type remedies, EPA never in the old days studied the question of what happens if the remedy fails. What are the long-term costs uh, to, the, um, to the remedy if it fails? We find that in their cost comparisons in all the records of decision in 1987, in cases where they choose containment, they once again never look at the question of whether that containment might fail and what the cost of dealing with that might be and calculate that as the, uh, in, when comparing it to treatment alternatives and more permanent alternatives. Uh, I don't recall seeing a, sing a single record of decision that, that looked at that question. One of the things that is of peculiar concern to me, and Ms. Greer touched upon it, is uh, an analysis of what goes on at particular sites. Uh, these things are highly technical, highly complicated. Uh, coming in and removing the barrels, as always, makes a lot of folks feel pretty good right away, but there's, as we know, a lot left after the barrels dis disappear. One of the provisions we put, uh, uh, we put in the last uh, uh, reauthorization was a te technical assistance grant program. Uh, it was designed to try to, A, give local folks or people with an interest in a local cleanup the uh, benefit of competent scientific advice to do the kind of analysis, Ms. Greer, on behalf of these groups here that you have been able to do in, in your report. Secondly, it was to try, I would clearly recall, I clearly recall, as to serve as a, as, a, as a counterbalance to avoid a rush to judgment where cleanups or recommendations for cleanups were, were inadequate, too fast, too quick, or too dirty. Can I ask uh, uh, anyone uh, of, of this panel to comment on the uh, Technical Assistance Grant Program? And then, Mr. Grumbly, I want to come back to you with your experience in clean sites to get your peculiar observations on this as well. Uh, well uh, Mr. Early, quite frankly, please. we're outraged at the uh, current state of the Technical Assistance Grant Program. As I think you already uh, recognized in your opening statement, uh, so-called interim final regulations finally came out this spring. Um, these regulations and the accompanying handbook for applying for a Technical Assistance Grant are that thick. They make filling out your income tax return look like child's play. H they are virtually unusable. You would spend more hiring a consultant to fill out the forms than you'll get in the grant. Um, and I predict that, the, that as a result we are going to have very few technical assistance grants um, granted under this program because the, the regulations are cumbersome, complicated, and for the lay person impossible to utilize. The alternative that the agency has offered is uh, having the states fill out the paperwork, but then the states get to choose who the technical advisor is going to be. 
no community is going to put up with that kind of alternative. Um, so we're, we're very depressed that, the, that uh, we're this far into the program and we do not have a workable technical assistance grants program. Uh, I might add that uh, as far as we know, none of the records of decision for fiscal year 87 uh, were there uh, technical assistance grants awarded to communities so that they could uh, more meaningfully participate in the uh, decision making process. That was my next question. Thank you for saving me to ask it. Mr. Fortuna, yes, I want to go to Mr. Grumbly too here. The, uh, we also believe the TAG grants are very important as well, not because our members would be doing any of that <clears throat> any of the technical assistance, but frankly, you know, ignorance is the best friend that Gridlock ever had. And frankly, it is the citizens' lack of understanding of the sites, the capabilities, the options before them that frequently leads to the type of uncertainty and Gridlock that Mr. Wallace uh, just discussed. So we see the technical assistance grants as a major way to bring the necessary information to the people who need it the most. Mr. Grumbly, please. At every place that we've been, the early intervention by knowledgeable community groups has helped speed the process along and helped move us forward to clean up. I'm glad to see that, that EPA's uh, TAG program is, is, is finally out. I think part of the reason why it didn't come out is that they were in the inevitable struggle with the White House Office of Management and Budget, um, and that undoubtedly delayed things and made some provisions of the TAG grants less favorable than they ought to be. In particular, we're very concerned about the EPA requirement for a 35 percent contribution of funds by the, uh, by the grantee in cash or in kind, when it's clear that the Congress intended that only 20 percent be the, be the number. But beyond any specifics that are involved in here, we, we believe that, that the agency really ought to trust the citizenry in this. As long as people can get themselves to competent technical advice, I believe that they'll participate constructively and helpfully in the, uh, in the cleanup process. So we congratulate them for having them out, but I think the uh, regs are too controlling. The administrative services contractor idea, I think, is, uh, is really a bad one in the sense that it simply introduces another layer of bureaucracy into the process, and, and I hope that that proposal will never reach uh, the light of day. Mr. Gromley, one of the great concerns I have is that the current mechanism uh, of enforcement is no induced, there is no inducement at all for folks to come forward. Uh, clearly there is not enough money here to clean these sites up if we do not have PRPs paying, paying their appropriate uh, uh, and fair share. How do we create the dynamic that makes it in a company's best interests? to come forward and participate in the cleanup rather than, than hide and, and there have been no 106s so it's really been, it's, they've got almost the best of both worlds. There ain't no 106s, there's nobody walking down, wa walking down the aisle saying I do. There's no shotgun and there's no wedding. Tell me how we get these folks to the altar. Well, I think you've analyzed the problem right. Um, I, I think the dynamic is really very simple. If, uh, if people come forward and uh, try to exercise their responsibility under the law and their friends uh, in, the, in the same business don't come forward, uh, that'll be the last time the first company comes forward. So I think that a couple of things have to be done. First, the agency has to make it clear that it's serious about cost recovery. Um, it, it needs to bring suits even if it doesn't win every one. Um, that's, that's down the line. You'll hear probably this afternoon people say that they don't bring cost recovery suits in some cases because they're afraid if they lose a cost recovery suit, if, if a judge finds the, the remedy to be arbitrary and capricious, that it'll blow up their entire program. I don't think that's the case if they, if they, bring, if they bring the appropriate cost recovery actions and if, as one hopes they are, they're implementing the law in accordance with the, uh, with the terms of the statute. So they've got to get more cost recovery, and to me that would be a, a, a major thing. Secondly, we do have to get them to use the enforcement tools that they have judiciously, selectively, and visibly. Uh, in my view, uh, Mr. Porter, the administrator, whoever the Attorney General of the United States is, ought to be standing up and visibly telling folks we're going to sue X, Y, and Z companies at uh, uh, at sites, whether they're sites where, where mixed funding has been involved or, or, or in other places. Now I say judiciously and thoughtfully because one can easily use the enforcement tools in such a way so that I would have to recommend to every company that they, that they back into the corner even more. So what we're talking about is developing a thoughtful situation in which you use the tools that you guys supplied you use the cost recovery actions that are built into the law, you use the threat of applying the Superfund 
in the appropriate way and the combination of that will bring private parties forward. We talk about voluntary participation. I mean, there's no question that this is, at some level, coerced voluntary participation. But that's nonetheless what needs to happen in order to get us further along in this problem. Mr. Wallace, is there anything in the uh, uh, NCP or the statute that would preclude the President, EPA, uh, from implementing some of the suggestions that uh, are the approach that you suggest? I don't believe so, Mr. Chairman. We looked at and worked with, of course, the NCP on a regular basis. Uh, we found, in fact, as we discussed this problem with a number of regional EPA site managers and our own people, that this was not something that needed to be changed that drastically. The problem seemed to be more in the, in the mindset of, of our own technologists and, and the governments and, and the PRPs, that the world is believing that if we study, 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 we can finally reach certainty uh, of a major proportion that will enable us to go forward. Well, Thomas Aquinas tried that a lot uh, <laughs> several hundred years ago, and he didn't reach a whole lot better conclusions well, on I, some of these I issues I'd hope that that would get into, into the record, because that's the kind of mindset change that needs to be made. We've unfortunately been a, a victim of our, our own need to focus in a number of narrow technologies and not step backward and, and would your approach reasons. affect the statutory preference for for treatment and permanent solutions no in fact it argues for it uh, i think the most robust solution is something that uh, would entail digging up finding all contamination and destroying it completely unfortunately that's not always technically feasible or uh, or do we have enough money to do those sorts of remedies? They're, they could be in the billions, depending upon the volume of the site. But insofar as uh, we can't do that, then it behooves us to put other uh, safety features on, other belts and suspenders, if you will, to make sure that if we leave any, that uh, there will be some sort of protection. There was a uh, commentator earlier of this century, Mr. Mencken, who once said that for every difficult, complex problem, there is often one simple solution. That's usually wrong. <laughs> uh, are you holding your suggestions out as a simple solution that may ultimately be wrong, that will give us quicker but uh, dirtier cleanups, potentially? Well, there must be a number of quotes that I could find also to counter that. Unfortunately, I'm an engineer and we don't study that sort of thing, but <laughs> the... <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are. I, <laughs> that's what I thought also. Uh, what I found is that it's deceptively simple. It's a problem where we have had the, some of the best minds and technologists who have unfortunately been focused on a, their own particular area of technique to try to understand this problem. We have not simply allowed us ourselves to step back and understand the full picture. I think what I'm describing is, is deceptively simple. It, it may not be because How I'm much time do you think we can save uh, expediting an, an RIFS if we take a, an implementation uh, perspective on what you suggest? Well, it depends on the site. As I stated in the testimony, it may be that we are going to take longer because we have not figured out exactly what the possibilities for uh, problems are or figured out the, uh, the right model. But there are some sites that I can show, and particularly in groundwater contamination problems, that we can probably knock off uh, a year and a five-year process. That's what our early calculations have, have said to us. Now, within that, there's got to be some assumptions. One is that uh, we start altering how things are procured, the, some of the institutional factors on getting lab results changed and some other detail, but I think that's possible on a restricted set of sites. The other thing you're solving is not having to follow a routine that tries to f totally characterize the site, and I think there, there's a number of opportunities to save more time simply by getting our heads straight on exactly what studies mean and how much data ought to be collected. Mr. Wolf? If I could uh, just add, Mr. Chairman, if, uh, and I'm not quite sure I understand exactly what Mr. Wallace is proposing, but if it would amount to a record of decision which acknowledged that there was uncertainty in a cleanup decision and that at a later time there would have to be modifications to that cleanup plan based upon uh, further discovery, I would hope that this would be something that would be effectively communicated to the public as part of the record of the decision and if there was to be further uh, 
tampering with the uh, remedial decision that that would be something the public would be involved in as well. But you do not have a fundamental objection to what it is he asserts. Well, I, I'd like to read his prepared statement and uh, try to figure out exactly what it is. But if what he's saying is that we need to have robust remedies to deal with uncertainty, and if the response to uncertainty is to err on the side of protecting human health, then uh, I think there are few who disagree with that. Let me, uh, let me ask uh, the panel generally, are there other recommendations that we haven't discussed, haven't touched upon yet, that you would like to, like to raise before us? Mr. Fortuna? I per perhaps what I could do is, instead of just taking off the recommendations in our statement, is offer a, a summary remark or a concluding remark that I think cuts through all the different presentations here this morning. That's usually what I get to do, but... Uh. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I won't steal it. Well, <laughs> Well, Mr. Chairman, unless you're planning to steal a quote from Pearl Buck, or use it, I won't steal it from you, but no, we'll uh, as, as Pearl Buck once said, without the truth, life would be exceedingly boring. And I think the truth of the matter here is that we have, what we have before us is a program that's being seriously mismanaged. Mismanaged, I mean, from a lot of different perspectives, but I think above all, what we have is we're falling into the all or none syndrome. Where EPA is saying, well, geez, we can't, contain, we can't incinerate every last scrap of soil at a site, so therefore we're going to contain it. We can't go out and find every last PRP, so therefore we're just going to go for the two or three deep pockets. And that's the problem. In a program where you do have a diversity of sites and a, and a complexity of situations, that while the more calls for leadership to establish some guidelines, some rules, and take some risks and go out and make some decisions that don't just reflect an all or none kind of philosophy. And that reflects itself in the treatment area in the form of going after the principal threats and, let's, and, and perhaps not worrying about all the low-level contaminated soil. But we certainly know that most of these sites have principal threats. It also involves going after more than just the two or three deep pockets at, at a Superfund site and hoping the other, the, the other folks will sue one another and get that money back. We need some leadership to expand the scope and involvement of EPA headquarters in this program or else it is going to be set to fail, as you observed in your opening statement. Well, first, let me ask unanimous consent that the memorandum of the committee dated June 17th uh, to all subcommittee members and all relevant uh, supporting documents be made part of, of uh, the record at the appropriate place. And let me also ask for unanimous consent, and I don't think I'm going to have problems getting it this morning, uh, that additional comments up through July 5th, uh, pursuant, I guess, to your request, Mr. Wolf, get a chance to make sure that we have uh, thoroughly digested most of what has been said here. Uh, that the record will be held open through July 5th uh, for additional comments and statements which will be made part of, of, of this uh, uh, subcommittee's hearing today. I want to thank the panel for uh, your candor. I want to thank the panel for your commitment. And most significantly, I want to thank the panel for sharing with us uh, your experiences to make a program that uh, we want to be successful actually uh, enjoy the success that the American people expect from it. This first panel is, uh, is excused. Thank you. Our second panel will be composed of uh, Dr. J. Winston Porter, Assistant Administrator for Solid Waste and Emergency Response with the Environmental Protection Agency. And he will be joined by Mr. Thomas L. Adams, Assistant Administrator for Enforcement and Compliance Monitoring, also with the Environmental Protection Agency. And Dr. James O. Mason, Director, Center for Disease Control, Department of Health and Human Services. Of course, as is the case with the subcommittee uh, and with the previous panel, uh, copies of the rules of the committee, particularly of the subcommittee on oversight and investigations, are made available to each of the witnesses. Copies of the rules of the House are also available. I would like to uh, advise, of course, each of the witnesses that they uh, are entitled to be accompanied by counsel for the purposes of advising you as a witness and not for providing testimony uh, to this committee. And I would like to ask uh, if each, uh, if any of the uh, witnesses uh, have counsel or seek to be represented by counsel. The record will note that uh, none assert that right. Uh, I would also like to remind each of the witnesses, uh, Mr. Porter, particularly you're familiar with uh, this, so this is not new, new to you, that uh, the subcommittee does receive all of its testimony under oath. Uh, do any of our witnesses have uh, any objection to being sworn? If not, let me ask you all to rise. Uh, 
raise your right hand and say, uh, I do, as appropriate. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Well, I guess I could say to you, uh, when uh, having heard what uh, transpired uh, before you, uh, so what do you say? But I will allow you a more formal setting uh, uh, to do that. Uh, Dr. Porter, we, uh, uh, you are not a stranger to this subcommittee. Uh, and the issues that you are involved with, uh, we acknowledge, are difficult uh, and uh, nettlesome. It is uh, the best hope and I believe your best wish as well that the Superfund program that this committee reauthorized be successful. And I know that uh, you are endeavoring to do that, to do so. We have a copy of your formal testimony, Dr. Porter. It will be inserted uh, in the record in its entirety. And at this point, you may uh, proceed as you see fit. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is the microphone on? Can you hear me? If you turn it on, it will be. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, I guess it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not totally sure. All things being equal, I just seem to be in Philadelphia, but I, I guess I'll stay here today. Um, I have with me today uh, Tom Adams, who is Assistant Administrator for Enforcement, John Cannon, Director of the Office of Waste Policy Enforcement, Walt Kovalec on my right, who is Deputy Head of the Superfund Office, and my extreme left, Steve Leifer, who is Acting Associate Enforcement Counsel for Waste. What I want to do is take a few minutes and um, give you my side of the story, so to speak, and talk about where I think we are in the program. I'm very proud of where we are, frankly, and I, and I, I want to talk to you about some areas where we are. But I do want to acknowledge some areas where we need improvement. There's absolutely no question. As I listen carefully to the previous panel, and, and if you listen carefully, what you'd hear is some opposite things being said. And, and I, that's not being a criticism. It's just simply that I, what I hear is a lot of opposite things, and that perhaps that's democracy. But we're trying to operate within these opposite things, but also accord with the law. Let me. Uh, talk about uh, the response program first. That is the removal program and, and, and the remedial program. As you indicated yourself, Mr. Chairman, the removal program I think has been a real success story. Since SARA, that is since the, the new amendments passed a year and a half ago, we've begun work at 315 sites and completed work at 271. In addition, responsible parties have begun removals at 101 sites and completed 65. Since inception of the Superfund program, we've got almost 1,200 removals that have been carried out. A little known fact, but that, that program we think has worked extremely well. Uh, what we want to next talk about is the preliminary assessment and site inspection phase of the program. As you know, these are used to narrow and focus the work that we do to find out which sites ought to become Superfund sites and which are the how to prioritize our work. Again, since Sarah, we've met the statutory goal of about 4,700 preliminary assessments that had to be done uh, by the beginning of this year. And in total, to this point, we've done about 6,000 preliminary assessments and 1,800 SIs. I think the theme you'll see, Mr. Chairman, as I go through this testimony, is we've made a very, very serious effort to meet these statutory deadlines. Uh, we now have about 950 sites in, on the NPL, with 200 more being uh, proposed this week, as a matter of fact, uh, which will give us about 1,150 sites, either proposed or final, on the NPL. With respect to RFSs, there was a lot of dialogue on that so far this morning, uh, and I'm going to talk more about that later. But Fundamentally, uh, we have taken dead aim on the target of 275 RFS starts by 1089. We've done a total of, we started a total of 157 so far, of which 71 have been done by responsible parties, potentially responsible parties. We expect to meet this deadline handily. Uh, some of the areas of improvements in RFS, and I'll just mention a few, and I found that some of the dialogue today very interesting, and I got some additional thoughts that we'll certainly think about. The thing I've done, as I've said, as a general matter, RFS has ought to be done in about 18 months. This is a very tough goal to achieve, but we do have a number of sites right now where people are coming in under 18 months with RFSs, and I'm going to challenge our contractors and our other people to meet that kind of time frame for most sites. Uh, like Mr. Wallace, I'm also an engineer. I've done a lot of this kind of work, and I think it's eminently doable that we can do these in about 18 months. Uh, the other thing I've tried to do is introduce a lot more competition in the process. One of the few secret weapons I've got, frankly, is a very well-developed, large, somewhat hungry engineering fraternity in this country who wants to work in this program. And we're going to have a lot of them working in the program, some 40 before too long, and we're going to operate in a very competitive environment. Those people that prove they can move work in a hurry are going to get more work, and those that prove they cannot move work with quality and expeditiously will get less work. That's been a problem, I think, in the program in the past, but we'll be challenging those folks to, to work rapidly and work uh, competently. So we are going to be selecting many more contractors uh, to do the work and have it much more competitive. 
With respect to the selection of remedy, which again came in for a lot of dialogue in earlier remarks, that's, I suppose, the heart of the program. In fact, to me, the two hearts of the program are two basic decisions. One is selection of remedy. What do you fundamentally do at a site? The other fundamental decision on the enforcement side is settlements, that is, reaching settlement with PRPs so they, in fact, will do the work. So the program is driven by two basic decision points, both of which I might add are very tough. One reason the NCP, the National Contingency Plan, is somewhat late, as you pointed out, is the selection of remedy process. Um, uh, Mr. Fortuna was right. I do carry around a three by five card with nine selection points on it, although I like to think there's a lot more, uh, I think we'll be able to show him a lot more material written than what's on that card. But it does serve to remind us there are eight or nine criteria we use to select these remedies, most of which, frankly, are taken right out of the law. Nothing I invented, they're right out of the law. Uh, and I think that's the real tension I would have with some of the people this morning, particularly on, the, on to my right, not politically but, but geographically, uh, is that the, uh, the, the simplistic nature they throw at this problem. Uh, what I'm trying to do is read all the law. I was quoted in the Times yesterday, and I think accurately, by saying the folks that are criticizing me, among other things, ought to read the law. And what the law says, in the same sentence it says permanence, it says cost effectiveness. It talks about getting community reaction to our remedies. It talks about the states paying 10% of the cost. That many times these remedies that folks uh, on, on that side of the panel wanted are in effect vetoed by the state who say they're not going to pay 10% of a $100 million remedy. They don't have that kind of money. They want to talk about options. So there's a, a lot of tensions here in selecting these remedies. Um, permanence is very important. Treatment is very important. But the others are very important also. So we are using the nine criteria and in point of fact are making decisions. Uh, the, we've made 112 records of decisions since Sarah, that is 112 rods. Uh, again, you wouldn't believe it from what you heard, but about two-thirds to three-fourths of them, Mr. Chairman, about two-thirds to three-fourths of them, if I can point out, of these records of decisions have involved treatment. Uh, it's not, a, and in fact, it's just the antithesis of what Mr. Fortuna said, it's not an all-or-nothing process. We frequently do treat the major threat and contain some of the more dilute material if it may cost hundreds of millions of dollars to rem remediate that. So we, we are trying to get a variety of remedies, and, the, and I think also the story is getting better. A lot of what they looked at were FY87 and earlier rods, or at least were started earlier. We've been tending, heading the tanker more and more toward more treatment and more permanence uh, pursuant to the law. I want to just mention, if I can, in passing, two quick real cases, because I think they make the point. We've been pillared a lot lately with real cases, um, somewhat unfairly in my opinion, but let me just mention a couple of them from my perspective. The, the poor little Crystal City Airport site down in Texas where Mr. Matuna drags up all the time and others and says we should have, we should have burnt, dug all that dirt up and burned it. There are several problems with that. First off, the contamination there had only migrated a few inches in 20 or 30 years. The major contaminant was arsenic, which would sail right through an incinerator and come out in the ash. It would cost 15 times as much to burn it. A very poor, poor community who was, in fact, the responsible party. So for a variety of reasons, we decided to, to dig the stuff up and contain it in a small area the groundwater is 700 feet deep. There's a very thick clay lens. We believe, and the state of Texas felt, this was a good remedy. There's then been a lot of dialogue about what a poor remedy that was, and we'll be happy to debate that if you want to. Uh, another one, chemical control site in New Jersey. Again, I'm, I'm just reacting to some of these one-liners, some of my own one-liners. But there, there's a site where, again, we were supposed to burn everything on a two-acre site in a floodplain with high chloride soil. Those are all very bad things with respect to incineration. A lot of corrosion problems, very small site, floodplain, et cetera. So there are, I guess the point I'm trying to make, Mr. Chairman, we have technical responses to everything they say. Reasonable people can disagree in terms of whether they're right and we're wrong. But what I really object to is this global sort of extrapolation because they can drop a few one-liners at a few sites that somehow the whole program has gone to hell in a handbasket. So you can see I'm mildly agitated. Um, we have reasons for what we're doing. I, I really believe our 3,000 employees out there are doing a good job and, and not at all helped by some of this criticism we get. Remedial design or remedial actions. Uh, again, we're going to meet the statutory deadline. The statutory deadline is 175 remedial actions by 1189, uh, 1089 actually. Uh, we, we're going to make that number. Uh, what that number does, by the way, that 175 remedial actions starts, it pulls together the whole program. If we don't get a lot of settlements with PRPs, and if we don't make a lot of fundamental rod decisions, we won't get there. We're tracking about 190 projects now. We expect some may slip, but we expect to make the 175. Again, since Sarah, uh, the fund has started 95 remedial designs and 48 remedial actions. PRPs have started 35 remedial designs and 25 remedial actions. 
Again, we think we made a lot of improvements. And, and again, they put the lie to some extent, this lack of attention to detail. The Corps of Engineers meets monthly at the Deputy Assistant Secretary level, for example, and goes line by line with us through every project they're involved with. So it's not like we don't care, Mr. Chairman. TAG grants, uh, not a good story, no question. We, should, we took a long time. We had a lot of debate on that issue. Uh, I was very frustrated. The OMB thing was probably about a three-week delay out of a year and a half, so I, I don't think we can blame it totally on that. We did have some disagreement with OMB on TAG grants. The TAG grants are out now. We're ready to start fielding them. The basic problem that was pointed out here today, and I'm frustrated by it also, is we decided to use the federal, the federal grant regulations, which are the operable thing. They're fairly complex. We're willing to sit down with people, go through them, help them any way we can to get these TAG grants. But I'm, I'm not happy about that. It did take too long. There's a lot going on in this program. And there was a lot of contention on how to do it. National Contingency Plan, uh, the, the basic rule for the program, that is, uh, we'll be at OMB this week for their review. Um, it has been delayed primarily due to the selection of remedy thing. Uh, state deferral has been a big issue, where in effect, all states want me to defer to the states of putting aside of the NPL if in fact they think they can handle it. Basically, all the EPA regions wanted to go the opposite way. So as you can sense, I had a fair debate there between 50 states and 10 EPA regions on which way we go. We decided to propose three options and let people uh, have their best shot at it. The other thing we've got in the NCP, which I think is very important, it picks up to some extent on what Mr. Wallace was saying, and that is a bias for action. We are going to try, this is a little different than the way he came at it, but we are going to try to be a little more empirical in the sense of when we see something that appears to work, let's get on with it while we continue studying the problem, because it is going to take time to solve some of these problems. But one of the criticisms I've had of, our, of ourselves is that we do study things too long, and that what we need to do is we see something obvious to be done, recognizing we're not finished, we need to continue to study, let's get on with the obvious part of the cleanup. And that's something we've, we debated at long length and will be in the NCP for comment. Let me switch, Mr. Chairman, to the enforcement side for just a moment. Uh, again, we had some good dialogue earlier about some things we need to do to improve enforcement. Uh, let me first say, though, before we all get too morose, let me give you a couple of statistics. Um, potential responsible parties have agreed to do 84 RIFSs since Sarah. We had targeted 63. They've agreed to do 84. So it isn't like nobody wants to, wants to help out in this program from the uh, voluntary side or the coerced side, depending on your view. We've also got settlements with PRPs to do about remedial design or remedial action at 23 sites for about $260 million. So I think we are getting people who, who want to help out on that, and we are trying to push the program. Mixed funding is one that Lee Thomas and I have both been frustrated. We haven't got more of. I think if you'll read my proactive memos, so-called, every quarter I send to the regions, you'll see over and over again pushing people to do mixed funding, pushing people to do minimus. And it has been a push because people are pretty shell-shocked from some of the early days of Superfund of making a mistake. They're very nervous about somebody says you left a dollar on the table or a billion or a million dollars or whatever. So we've said it's okay to make a decision. It's okay to use mixed funding. It's okay to use de minimis. But it isn't the simplistic sort of thing that some of the people here made it sound like earlier. And in a ma matter of fact, we have got three pre-authorizations now on mixed funding. We have one that involves so-called mixed work where we do part of the work and the PRPs do the work. We've identified 17 additional sites with mixed funding potential and we'll push hard on those. De minimis has been equally frustrating in the sense that uh, there has been some reluctance by ourselves to use it. We have two de minimis settlements now, additional six in the concurrence phase, and we're negotiating for de minimis at 14 other sites. So I think the pushing that Lee and I and others have done recently have helped on both those angles, that de minimis and mixed funding are very strong tools. We believe in them wholeheartedly and, and we intend to use them. With respect to orders, the comment was made, I believe, in, in your statement, Mr. Chairman, and it's a valid criticism that we have not done enough in the way of unilateral orders, no question about it. We've only re referred one case to justice for injunctive action since FYD7 on the RDRA side. Lee Thomas uh, had a meeting with that. We had a, a conference call with all of our uh, regions about two months ago and basically directed them to develop additional 106 orders. We, uh, now, th there's, again, people are not totally crazy out there. One of the reasons they didn't want a lot of 106 orders, their experience with them has been extremely time-consuming, contentious, and never-ending when this thing gets into court. So we want to settle things without going to court. On the other hand, we, we know that for the good of the program, even if it's, it's kind of like taking bitter medicine, you've occasionally got to work through some to let people know you'll really use it. Uh, so even though we're getting quite a few settlements, uh, we, we want to get more, and certainly the carrot and the stick is important. I was actually the one, I believe, who coined that phrase. It wasn't Joe Biden, it was me. Uh, the phrase about um, shooting the volunteers. 
uh, actually what I said is we tend to shoot the people that come forward under a white flag. That was the exact uh, comment I used. And I think that's true. We've tended, when people have come forward and wanted to talk, we've tended to, to sort of ratchet them down to 100% if we could. We're trying to change that. I won't go through all the reasons, but we, we try to change that to say, if people come forward with a good offer, let's sort of reward the good guys, so to speak, with a good settlement, and then let's go after the guys that didn't come forward. And, and we really are trying to do that. And, and we have a list of 25 106 orders we've come up with. All of those won't survive, but a lot of them will survive, and we're going to be working through those this summer. I wrote a letter, as a matter of fact, Mr. Chairman, you picked up on the Chemical Week article. I have a letter to the editor I sent to them, which I'll be happy to supply you in which I said that I really hope people don't take aid and comfort from that article because it was a very inaccurate depiction of our resolve to do enforcement. And I think people are going to be sorely surprised if they, if they think that, in fact, some of the stuff said in that w w was true. Um, cost recovery, again, not a great story. We need to do more in cost recovery. We have $78 million since inception. Since Sarah, we filed $60 million worth of cost recovery. Uh, and, and since the total inception of the program, a lot of things are percolating through now. We have about $250 million of cases referred to justice. Uh, I got to also point out though on cost recovery that we're just at the point now the last year or so where these major construction projects are getting into play and, and we're now recovering the larger cost. Earlier on we had hundreds of cases but they usually involve very small amounts. Federal facilities uh, is an issue that I'm surprised hasn't come up yet but I'm sure it will. Uh, we working hard on federal facilities. We have a number of sites put on the national priority list. We expect to add another 50 to 70 soon. As you know, we've developed a, a technical assistance or, or inter interagency agreement at the Twin Cities Army Ammunition Plant. We now have model interagency agreement language with the Department of Energy and as of last Friday with the Department of Defense also. So we have model IAG language with both of the major uh, departmentalities that we, we're dealing with and we intend to be using that. Th after a lot of hard work, we have, we think, all the fundamentals we need in those, those interagency agreements. We have state and citizen enforceability. We have dispute resolution with EPA administrator being the final decision maker. We have stipulated penalties. So I feel good about that. We, I'm, I'm sorry it took so long, but, but I think we're making progress. Uh, I'm not going to go over, Mr. Chairman, it's in my prepared testimony about Title III and underground storage tanks and R&D, other minor programs that we're trying to administer in our spare time, but there, there is a lot of work going on in those also. Um, let me close by saying that we have, a, as you know, a very large complex program. We're on track for the major statutory goals. We have 3,000 employees and a billion and a half dollar a year budget. You might say parenthetically that we're going to spend the money. And so this idea that I'm working on the cheap somehow with respect to individual remedies, the real question there is are we going to spread that money over a lot of sites pursuant to what we thought Congress said with the targets, or are we going to let be hanged and, with respect to cost and just spend all the money on a few sites? I guess it's, it's sort of obvious where we're coming from. We're going to try to have good protective remedies at every site. We're going to try to follow the statutory requirements. We're also going to try to meet the requirements to do a lot of work at a lot of sites. To echo this or to point this out, Mr. Chairman, as we sit here, we have in progress 640 RIFSs, 140 remedial designs, and 100 remedial actions. So it is a large program. I would just urge people again to read all of the law. We're trying to read all of it with respect to the schedules and, and all the aspects we have to be concerned about. Uh, and I think that brings a real tempering effect to some of the comments that people will read all of it. I think what people are doing is picking a word here and a word there. Particularly, you know, some people are selling treatment plants, such as Mr. Fortuna. I can understand where he's coming from, but that's not my job to sell treatment plants. My job is to look at all the law and do, it, and do the best thing possible. Mm -hmm. I do want to have good protective, cost-effective remedies. I do want to have strong enforcement. Uh, I do want to have more work by PRPs, and I want to increase the pace of the program. And I think we're, we're on good track to do all of those. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to work with this committee uh, closely because we do have a, a tiger by the tail here and want to work with you as you move ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Porter. Dr. James Mason, the director of the uh, Center for Disease Control from the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Mason. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, uh, I'd like to correct my title. Uh, I'm actually here as the administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry. I do wear two hats and I'm also the director of the Centers for Disease Control. But ATSDR is one of seven agencies of the United States Public Health Service. We have uh, a budget of uh, 43 million dollars this year. Can I move the microphone a little closer there, Doctor? Thank you. Thank you. We have a uh, 
a budget of $43 million this year and 175 FTEs. So we're a bit smaller than EPA, but nevertheless, we're trying to carry out our responsibilities. My uh, written testimony uh, has been uh, submitted, and uh, so I'll uh, be uh, fairly brief. Under uh, Superfund, uh, our agency is responsible for developing information, providing certain public health services, and for research. Sarah charged the agency with several significant new responsibilities. It increased the number of health assessments that we are required to conduct. It expanded the toxicology database that the agency maintains and increased our medical and health education activities. Sarah also required the agency to report to Congress on the nature and extent of childhood lead poisoning in the U United States. Over the past two years, the agency has made significant progress toward meeting the challenges of this legislation. We've organized the agency and its programs. We've recruited and trained new staff. We've expanded the program of health assessments. We've developed a list of 100 prioritized hazardous substances, and we've developed toxicological profiles and prepared a comprehensive draft report on childhood lead poisoning. We're also developing exposure registries, site-specific health surveillance programs, and substance-specific research, and we're expanding health education activities. Now, I'd like to briefly discuss three of the more significant SARA mandates. The first is health assessments. We're required to complete by December 10th of this year a health assessment of all of the 951 sites on the national priority list. In cooperation with 11 states, which we have agreements, we have completed health assessments so far on 353 NPL sites. We are optimistic that in 1988, health assessments will be conducted in all 951 sites. We regard these health assessments and their public health implications as important components in the investigation of individual way sites. Sarah permits a licensed physician or other individual to petition ATSDR for a health assessment at a site of concern. We've received to date 30 such petitions from a variety of petitioners, including individual citizens, members of Congress, and local authorities. We respond to each petition by seeking as much background data as possible. Although each of these health assessments requires approximately four times the resources of a non-petitioned assessment, we believe that the petitioned health assessment is an excellent way for individuals to express concern to their government. Often another important outcome of health assessment is a recommendation for public health action. Fourteen pilot health studies are now underway to assess human exposure to hazardous substances at specific waste sites. Additionally, the agency over the past two years has issued two health advisories. These are statements to EPA that a site is of such sufficient public health concern now at this time that immediate action should be taken to prevent exposure to the substances in question. With regard to toxicological profiles, we're mandated in cooperation with EPA to prioritize hazardous substances at NPL sites and then to prepare a toxicological profile for each rank substance. The first list of the 100 most hazardous substances was released April 17, 1987. Sarah requires that this list be enlarged by 100 additional substances on or before October 17, 1988. This deadline will be met. The agency has also worked with EPA and the National Toxicology Program to prepare and release for public review the first 25 toxicological profiles. 
We are now preparing the next set of 25 profiles due in 1988. There has been great interest in these documents. To date, we have distributed 37,000 copies of the draft profiles. SARA also directs ATSDR, EPA, and the National Toxicology Program to evaluate data gaps for each hazardous substance that is the subject of a toxicological profile. These gaps that represent significant data needs are to be filled by research initiated by ATSDR. The three federal groups are developing a means to identify significant data gaps. Implementation of a research program will follow. Childhood lead poisoning. SARA requires ATSDR in consultation with EPA to prepare a report to Congress on the nature and extent of childhood lead poisoning in the United States. The preparation of the study and the resulting report was performed by two consultants to ATSDR. As you know, the agency was unable to complete the report by March 1, 1987. The data on childhood lead poisoning had to be acquired, statistical estimation models were extended, and a lengthy analysis and two peer reviews of the findings were conducted. The agency's concern has been to prepare a report of the highest scientific quality. The report is currently under review in the Office of the Secretary, Department of Health and Human Services, waiting final clearance. Sarah strengthened the requirement for peer review of ATSDR studies and reports. Each of the reports prepared by the agency or under its sponsorship has been peer reviewed. The agency is fully committed to conducting high quality science. Toward that end, we have recently established a board of scientific counselors for ATSDR and look forward to the board's advice on matters of science. Mr. Chairman, we'll be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mason. Uh, I do appreciate the fact that you wear several hats. I wasn't quite sure where to rank all of those hats that, uh, in, in terms of introducing you. Uh, I was impressed with the testimony and the number of health assessments and pilot studies uh, that, uh, that are underway. I hope this means that the agency has so far been able to obtain the appropriate and necessary budget uh, financing and personnel slots to, to achieve the ramping up of, of, the, of these numbers. Could you advise this committee on the adequacy of the agency's resources in this regard? We have two problems, one dollars and the other full-time equivalents. Of the two up to now, full-time equivalents have been the greatest problem. As we move into the future, both of these will represent a significant uh, problem. The authorization language commits us to certain statutory activities right. and without the resources to balance uh, our ability to perform, it's uh, not likely that uh, beginning in the next fiscal year that we'll be able to carry out our mandates because of resource problems. Which specific mandates do you believe will, will prove to be most nettlesome to you given your current staffing levels? Currently, we have 175 full-time equivalents. In our authorization, we should have 250 in fiscal year 1989. Without that FTE authorization and the full dollar authorization, we're going to have to cut back on almost all of the statutory requirements. That doesn't mean we won't get any of them done. It simply won't meet the numbers that have been prescribed by the uh, statutes. Well, the members of this committee would be very interested in uh, working with the uh, relevant appropriating committees to make sure that uh, that, uh, that that comes, that help comes your way. The, as you know, I think uh, just from what your agencies have dealt with, the people, they, they live in fear of living near these near these sites and the information and assistance that you can provide them is, is going to be helpful so we will be happy to, to assist them. Uh, the data gaps that, 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 that you referred to, I guess that's, that's your term or a term, or a term of art. Uh, in, given the current status, as we just discussed, 
are, are we going to continue to have data gaps? Are we going to be able to close the breadth of those gaps, given given the, the personnel and, and the, the, uh, the dollars in the FTE problems that you have? The um, toxicological profiles uh, have been crafted uh, with one purpose in mind. There, there are a number of purposes, but one of those purposes is to identify significant data gaps that can only be solved by research. We find in the first 25 toxicological profiles that human exposure data and human effects uh, represents the greatest gap. We have uh, a fair amount of uh, experimental animal data uh, that you can at times extrapolate to human beings, but as we found out with uh, some of the dioxins, uh, animal data, human data uh, do not uh, apparently parallel each other. So one of the gaps that will come up in almost all of the toxicological profiles is human exposure data and the effects on humans. That is uh, difficult to get. Uh, it's expensive data to accumulate. And I'm not sure that uh, provisions of Superfund at this point in time have identified a way to close those research gaps. In other words, uh, I don't know of money in EPA in ATSDR or even the National Toxicological Profiles uh, budget that would specifically get at those data gaps. How long does it take from receipt of a petition to decision on whether or not to do a health assessment? I'd like to uh, ask uh, Dr. Barry Johnson, who mm -hmm. is the Associate Administrator of uh, ATSDR, if he'd address that question. Dr. Johnson? Mr. Chairman, it depends upon the uh, timing the typical time to respond to a petitioner uh, runs about three weeks, and that's simply a letter of acknowledgement. That letter goes back to the petitioner, indicates uh, that uh, a personal contact will be made with the petitioner by one of our regional representatives, and that initial uh, contact begins the uh, effort. The agency then uh, obtains whatever data we can in support of the petition, data from EPA regions, data from state health uh, uh, departments, from local health departments, uh, data from the petitioner, him or herself. Based upon that data, we will make a decision whether or not we can undertake a full health assessment. If we cannot, then the petitioner will be so informed. Uh, that decision process may take six months. Uh, to date, we have turned down one petition out of the uh, approximately 30 that we have received. Are the petitions coming to you adequately documented to, to make your decision uh, process easier? Very few come with adequate supporting documentation. Uh, approximately one half of the petitions we have received to date have, um, have been concerned with sites already on the national priorities list. Therefore, there is some extant data that we can use uh, to evaluate uh, how to handle the petition. The remaining one half that we've received, i.e. approximately 15 to 16 petitions, have come bearing uh, relatively little data but have expressed uh, uh, health concerns. But you, f you help fill in those blanks for them then, don't you, as, as I understand you. you just, if they don't, do not have what they, what they need on the face of, of uh, the four corners of the document, you work with them to fill that? We do. There's a great deal of personal contact that goes on between our staff, especially our regional staff and the petitioner. We try to assist the uh, petitioner to uh, develop uh, data that he or she may have. We, uh, as I said before, will un do undertake an active effort to gain whatever data that, may, that states or uh, EPA may have in their regional offices. Dr. Mason, your testimony, you stated that each uh, health assessment ATSDR performs contains off specific recommendations as to actions that the agency believes would be uh, or should be considered in protecting the public health and that the EPA often uh, accepts, I guess about 95 percent is your reference of those recommendations. Can you elaborate on what types of actions those are that, just give us a little photo of what that may be, or Dr. Johnson, please. Mr. Chairman, each of our uh, health assessments contains our analysis of the data that characterize that particular site. And that would be environmental health data, uh, uh, human health data, uh, modeling data, uh, EPA conducted risk assessments and so forth. From that analysis, we will state our position with regard to the public health implications posed by that particular site. Uh, that's a qualitative statement of public health concern. 
In each health assessment report, we will also uh, present various recommendations to EPA for their consideration. EPA and the states uh, are the risk managers for the sites. We are a health agency. We provide advice and, and counsel. The kind of recommendations that we provide can be along the lines of additional uh, environmental data needed to better characterize the site. Sometimes we will say that we are sufficiently concerned by the uh, presence of the sites that have been already identified to recommend uh, that uh, alternate water uh, su be supplied to persons at risk of exposure. We uh, may recommend uh, a controlled access to the site until it, is, uh, until it is remediated. Those are some kinds of recommendations that we provide. Either Dr. Johnson or Dr. Mason, our, uh, the previous panel testified to uh, uh, unevenness uh, in the performance of the various regions. Do you, in your dealings with the various regions and the performances of health assessments, find certain regions place more value and are quicker to respond than, than others in terms of the recommendations that you make? Mr. Chairman, there is some, some difference in, across the EPA regions. Uh, depending upon how it seems that particular region is organized and the staff within that region uh, some regions uh, uh, provide information on perhaps a bit more timely basis than others. Uh, overall, I would have to offer the opinion that the EPA regions function, in our experience, pretty well in supplying the RIFS data and uh, assisting us in, in our job uh, under Superfund. Dr. Mason, did you want to add anything to that? Just giving you the last chance to add anything. We appreciate the opportunity of being here. Uh, lead poisoning, Dr. Mason, if I can. Uh, uh, I think we're all concerned about, obviously, this, this phenomena. Uh, millions of uh, white and black metropolitan children under the age of five uh, have lead blood levels associated with adverse health effects. The uh, report you referenced to, of course, was, has had a, some level of, of controversy uh, uh, attached to it. When do we expect that uh, the Secretary will release this, this report, and uh, what, if, if any, bureaucratic problems vis-a-vis -vis dealing with the uh, Office of Management and Budget have been attributed to, to the delay here? I don't want to lay any blame on the review process at the Public Health Service and Secretary's level. Uh, the delays have uh, uh, basically been the problem of uh, our agency and they are scientific problems rather than bureaucratic problems. Uh, it's a little like uh, pregnancy. You can't put nine women together and uh, uh, get a baby born in one month. It takes nine months to get the job done. And I'm not sure that without uh, uh, being critical of Congress, I'm not sure that Congress totally understood when they provided the de deadline uh, of the difficulty of bringing the data together, uh, of analyzing data that uh, was not readily available when the responsibility was given to us. The process of peer review, and I think that's where the controversy came into this thing. It uh, wasn't a, a difference between science and politics. It was a, uh, a lack of uh, agreement between uh, various scientific issues. And those had to be resolved. And I believe the document will be much more useful to the people of this nation uh, as a result of these delays, which uh, are part of the uh, scientific process. Well, any time the work product is improved because certainly of peer review, which I know everyone in this committee, uh, virtually everyone, I guess is a, always a safer way to, to express it, uh, uh, support, uh, will lend greater credence to the document. I think will make it, uh, help it serve better uh, as, a, uh, as a touchstone for all public policy makers uh, uh, to focus on. Uh, but I think we also need to understand that like the earlier panel had suggested, there is oftentimes a, a lot of time between uh, uh, the study and, and, and the release of that study. This committee has had uh, 
and not directed towards you in any way, Dr. Mason, uh, a long history of exposure to things that, uh, documents that have uh, required constant refrigeration, they were saved so long. And the committee's concern, once again, is not as to the quality of the science that you have engaged in and the research that you have done, but to what extent things that, that would be beyond the agency's scientific and research capabilities that have contributed to, uh, to the delay. That's this committee's interest. Good science that serves us all very well. Uh, bureaucratic delays or, or things getting buried in the in, in, in the bowels of, uh, of the Office of Management and Budget do not serve the American people very well. And, and I have had a lot of personal experience in that regard, and it's affected Mr. Porter's performance several times, too, and it's not something that we, we hold him or you responsible for. We understand there's a difficult set of circumstances here. We anxiously await the, the Secretary's release of the report because we think it can be a very important document. Mr. Porter, now that you've had a chance to uh, kind of sort things out. Let me, let me just assert one thing to you. You, 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 you mentioned earlier that uh, some of the evidence raised was anecdotal in nature and, 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 and you defended some of the criticisms of the particular cleanups. You mentioned that uh, uh, Mr. Fortuna is in the business of selling uh, uh, treatments. And What impressed me though most about the first panel win is, or Mr. Porter, is this. You've got environmentalists, you have folks who want permanent treatment, you have major contractors, you have an, an article, and I look forward to the letter to the editor that, uh, that, you will, uh, that you will hopefully be published, but it was based on interviews with some folks within your own agency, um, coupled with folks in the industry None of, all of which kind of, uh, of, in almost a synergistic way, do not create a very flattering picture. How do you respond to the more general focus that some regions are doing so much better than others on peculiar sites? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think that's a, a valid criticism. Uh, we're dealing with real people here, and we try to give them uniform guidance. I talk to all the regional administrators frequently and the other folks. Uh, we are meeting this week, for example, two days with our waste division directors from all ten regions to go over a lot of these issues. But there's no question that some are doing better than others. I think you have to look beyond that to some extent, though. There's other factors operative here. The, the relation with states in some of those regions are different. I mean, certainly uh, Chris Dagan in Region 2 has a handful with New York and New Jersey uh, in the sense that they have very strong opinions on how to do this job. Uh, other people in the state of Michigan has very strong views on how this job ought to be done and, and on and on. So I think that may be part of it, but I think we're striving, and that frustrates Lee, and I, Lee Thomas and I very much, when we look at the numbers quarter by quarter and we see that some regions, Region 3, I'll, let's be positive, Region 3 seems to always get the job done in Philadelphia. Uh, they have very good people. They're very well organized. They seem to always get the job done. No question about it. I'm not going to be negative about others, but then there's a gradation down to others. And I think all we can do is we are, uh, we are trying to work with the regions. We are trying to get good people in all the, all the spots. Uh, they're working with different states who have their own views. Some of the problems are quite different. But I will say this, Mr. Chairman, if I can, is that I've never been around a group of people uh, that have worked so hard. Lee Thomas made that comment the other day at the Overstar hearing, and I would echo it, that people are working very, very hard out there. Uh, and I think they're trying hard. They're, they've been criticized a lot, so they're fairly cautious. But uh, that is one of my major challenges. How do we get more uniform uh, performance? Well, there's no doubt, uh, Mr. Porter, that uh, some folks out there are gun-shy. Uh, they have a right to be when a program, uh, program's first administrators uh, came to town with the sole purpose of perverting the program. Uh, they paid a price for that. And I understand the concern about they're not going to leave the last dollar on the table. Um, but we also have a public that is just demanding more from both of us. Uh, and and that's, uh, that, that's, that's significant. Your own Office of Planning Poli Policy Planning and Evaluations, uh, September 87 memo, just touched on some of the same things that uh, previous panel. Uh, regions operate in relative isolation. 
No one is in a position to really know if, if inconsistencies are occurring. Uh, no, no national examination of risks assessment in detail to uncover discrepancies. How are you going to fix this ten-headed hydra out there, uh, or how are you going to how are you going to lash all of these ten horses into a trace that uh, can get them pulling the wagon in, in the same direction? Well, it's a challenge, Mr. Chairman, for a couple of reasons. One is that, on the one hand, I find the more I delegate, the more it gets done. That's the good news because I think people need some flexibility to make these decisions. And uh, previously, people carried. Sure, you want that on the record? Well, yeah, I, I want I want that definitely on the record. The, the more they get done, the more we delegate. That's the sort of good news, I say. The bad news, to the extent there is bad news, you worry some about quality. You worry about, uh, is everybody doing everything perfectly? And, and there is some continuum on this, because I can assure you that if every decision comes to Washington, or everything gets micromanaged in Washington, you're back to the six sites in five years being cleaned up. One of the reasons we've moved a lot of these things in my administration, frankly, at least I think so, is we have delegated. We've told people it's okay to make a decision. We'll back you up. We want to work with you. And what we're trying to do is really, uh, you know, through looking at the rods, and we do look at the rods, to look at the other aspects, to be sure that we're aware of what's going on. The other point, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make is, as I've said a number of times, these are site-specific decisions. I have really given up, so to speak, in the sense of saying there's some simple cookbook I can give people so you just have a clerk in the region who would then make a perfect remedy selection. These are tough, judgmental calls. And so that's the reason I object to these kind of one-liners about remedies, because what has usually happened is someone has struggled with that for two or three years up to the regional administrator level, and uh, they're very tough calls. And I wish there was some simple answer well, I could the one, give them. The one-liner about a remedy is, 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 is probably tough to defend, and, and all of us get called to undo. But, but, I mean, how do you deal with the criticism that Mrs. Greer, Ms. Greer offered about uh, lead contaminated soil range of contaminants, uh, the cleanups from 14 parts per million up through 100 parts per million. I'm going to have Mr. Kovalec respond to that. You don't want to try that? Well, I'll, I'll make a run at it generically. I can't, he can give you more specificity, but I think the short answer is that again, you've got to look at the legally applicable or relevant and appropriate standards at that site. That's what Congress told us to do. And I, I'm doing a number of docks and rods right now, for example. I'm doing Love Canal, Times Beach, and a place called Vertac. We will be using somewhat different action levels at all three of those because the exposure pattern and a lot of other factors are different. In Love Canal, I was worried about bioaccumulation in fish in the creek. That was what was driving it. At, mm -hmm. at Times Beach, I'm worried. I'm in a floodplain. The state has said no one's going to live there. It's a different level. Uh, by the way, we're, I've chosen incineration at both those, you might be interested to know. Uh, Vertac is a very different sort of thing. It, it's going to be hundreds of acres of, of very, very lightly contaminated with dachshund. So, you know, you've got to look at the facts on the ground, and I, I will try to respond to that, but that's my now general answer is you've got to we'll, look specifically at each case. Let's take a look at lead if we can for a second. Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure I have the uh, exact response you were interested in on lead, but I wanted to, because we just heard Ms. Greer's criticism this morning, but I wanted to offer some comments on what we're trying to do in terms of guidance and oversight on questions of consistency. Is, is there a uniform exposure assessment for lead? There is a uniform Superfund public health evaluation manual, which has been in existence uh, at least 12 months, if not longer. It's a two-inch, inch-and-a-half thick volume, which goes to all of our regional offices, all of our contractors, and she's probably quite right. If you only read the 50-page record of decision document, you're not going to be able to follow through the logic that went on in any particular case. That is the guidance we're trying to get each region to use for all the chemicals. Lead is one. There, uh, she mentioned several others. We're also working and have underway a uniform exposure assessment manual to strive to be more consistent so that everyone's making the same assumptions about what's the likelihood of how many grams. But that manual lead. does not exist today. The uniform exposure assessment manual does not exist. I think exist we, have, today. we have a working group working on it. And how close are we to getting that finished? I think that's this calendar year's business, to the best of my knowledge. And what's it going to say about lead? I don't have a specific answer about lead. It deals with exposure roots. That is, how much soil is someone likely to take in as a child versus an adult because childs drop food and lollipops and so forth. I think if I could make one more comment, Mr. Sure. Chairman, her quotation was, and I guess that's what we focus on, is all remedies, how can all remedies be equally protective with different numbers? Our view is that all remedies are going to be protective. That's what the law says. 
the implication is that a number that's different from 7 to 14 to 50 somehow doesn't provide protection. And I think the focus is if only if the numbers are all the same, given all the differences at sites that Dr. Porter described, is the remedy protective. And I think that's where we disagree. Sites can be protective without having an identical number for every chemical. Synergisms are involved, the, will, the problem of the state involvement, and others. The significance, though, is that the, uh, there's a rather emotional debate about lead. It is not only emotional, though, that the, I don't know what your science is going to tell us, Dr. Mason, but I suspect it's not going to be particularly pleasant. Um, and the bottom line is, is that if you lived someplace where it was 100 parts per million, I can find that, uh, Williams property or Cooper Road, 100 parts per million, or the sh Schmaltz dump in Wisconsin at 14 parts, folks don't understand that you're telling them that a cleanup is equally protective of human health and the environment when one is uh, seven times greater than the other. So there better be a very good reason for it because maybe the science will tell us that that is acceptable, but right now the constituents don't, don't, don't believe that. Um, Mr. Porter, let me move off of that. When, when wastes are excavated and redisposed on site, is the EPA fully applying the provisions, uh, applying the land ban provisions? Yes, we will be uh, when those provisions all kick into place. We, they're not all in place yet, but as they do, we will, yes. We and also are doing, uh, but there's some dates, and I don't have them all right in mind right now. There's a number of dates for which various things apply. In addition, we are supposed to uh, come up with some soil and debris best of demonstrated available technology for those soils. So. It's kind of a complicated answer, which, uh, but fundamentally we are going to have to apply those when it's appropriate. Define for me when you believe that's, that it is appropriate. Well, uh, for example, with respect to solvents and dioxins, uh, it'll be this fall uh, because we, ha we, we put out that rule two years ago and then uh, gave people a two-year capacity extension. That two years will be up soon. Uh, there's other, other materials. This summer, for example, there's various materials that will, will come in the first thirds this summer. Do you believe that uh, uh, capping and containment is a permanent remedy? I think it can be. Uh, I, I, I tend to think a permanent is permanently effective. I think that what you're going to have to do in some cases is where it's a very dilute material and it's very non-cost effective or otherwise improper to, to, for example, dig something up and burn it, you're going to have some cases where and it gets to the mixed arrangement that Mr. Fortuna even alluded to where you may have some capping and you may have some treatment. I don't think, I think if I can say, one of the problems, the, the memo that Mr. Fortuna or the dialogue you referred to um, a few months ago where I was excited about incineration, I might say that Lee Thomas was more excited, but the reason we were excited is we thought people were interpreting permanence meaning in every single case you dig everything up and burn it. And, and what, in that particular region, there were three or four projects, each of which was about $100 million, which would have taken half to two-thirds of my construction budget that year for three projects. So I got excited in the sense of saying, Permanence, I don't know what it means precisely in all cases, but it doesn't always mean dig it up and burn it. So I think permanence is a permanently effective remedy. You look at all the facts. It's also something, I think Mr. Uh, Hirshhorn made this comment in a previous hearing, and I, one of the few things I agree with him on, is that it's a remedy where you don't have to keep coming back and changing things, or words to that effect. If you think this is something which is permanent in the sense that when you do it, uh, your home free, so to speak, as opposed to knowing you'll have to come back and do something else, then it might be permanent. We simply have some sites, like it or not, where there's probably not enough money in the world to dig all of those things up and burn them. Uh, we're going to have to contain certain materials on site at, at protective levels, as opposed to digging things up that are in the part per billion or two parts per billion range and, and doing something with them. So I think they can be permanent, yes. It's my contention that the, uh, the failure to, to propose, let alone finalize, the NCP after 20 months is having a suffocating effect on the program. How are we going to take the pillow off of this thing and let it breathe? Well, it's uh, over at my friends at OMB this week. And, um, oh, we're back there again. <laughs> uh, what I intend to do is very hard push this summer through the 60-day review period uh, that they have to review this document and get it out. You know, I've, I've, I've actually I've, uh, uh, intend to hold them to the 60 days. Um, I, I do think, though, that a lot of things that are in the NCP that we have begun moving forward with through guidance and other things. This is not final because people will get a chance to comment on it. 
but it, the fact that we've done 112 rods and some other things leads me to believe that we're not dead in the water. I would certainly much rather have the NCP out than not have it out. I'm very disappointed it's taken so long, but it's one of my highest priorities in my remaining time here is to get it out, at least proposed, and, and move ahead. Will you go forward with it after 60 days? Well, um, we have a little problem with the executive order, as you may know on that, in the sense that it came down saying that, that OMB should concur on the, on the NCP, which is a little stronger language than some of us would have liked. But uh, I, I would say that uh, we're going to get it out in that time frame. Let's just leave it at that. I, I think that we can, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Lee Thomas and I will be heavily involved if it isn't out by then, and I'll just sort of leave it at that. I, I can't go against the executive order, but I think we can work it out. What, uh, is there a, is there a, uh, is there a drop dead date? Well, I'm going to operate on 60 days. 60 days is not a, uh, a legally binding date because we don't have laws with respect to ourselves and OMB. It's and from when you sent it When to you sent it over, right. And so what I want to do is use that as a sort of a target date. Uh, that'll be, number one, will be very visible to all of us. And uh, I think that there's no reason we shouldn't be able to work it through in that time frame. And I understand you just sent it to him, what, in the last week? Uh, it should days? go this week. It actually went out of my office uh, late last week and is being mechanically transmitted through the various paperwork to OMB this week. So they, sh they will have it this week. Try the post office. might get there a little faster. We'll hand carry it, yeah. Okay. Let me focus on some of the numbers that you talked about. And you said folks were accusing you of doing things, doing things on, on, on the cheap. The, uh, we, we visited with the EPA comptroller. Uh, who advised us the following numbers. Uh, in the first two years since Sarah, the EPA will have spent $200 million less than was budgeted for cleanup. For remedial actions in fiscal year 87, the EPA budgeted $258 million, but only spent 160. million. In fiscal year 88, the estimated remedial action expenditures are estimated at $484.8 million against a budget of 594.5. However, your fiscal year 88 expenditures through the second quarter are only $80 million. So rather surprising numbers. How do you account for the agency's so far failure to spend the budgeted money for remedial actions? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that there's a couple of things. One is we have found, uh, and, and we're going to have, it looks like this year we're going to be very close to the numbers that we estimated. But what we've had trouble doing... 484? Right? Yes. What, what we've had trouble doing, frankly, is toward the end of the year on some of these major construction projects, we've had some slipping, slippage in the sense of getting them to bid. For example, last year there was one major project that we thought would go out in that year and, in fact, didn't. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough job to get some of these $1,500 and $100 million projects into the bid process. And if you miss by a short period of time, you've missed that time. We've spent, it a lot of that, we've spent some of that money, though, back on, on RFSs, which has been a source of some contention also. But we, we really are aiming hard at spending that money. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a matter of getting it through the system, getting the Corps of Engineers design finished, getting their bid documents out, and whatever. Uh, we have this large pipeline of work, and we're just having to push hard to get it through the pipeline. Well, again, once, uh, once you take a look at what this money goes to, the actual putting the shovel in the ground or whatever it is that's appropriate to do, this... Uh, this is, as they say in the auto racing business, where the rubber meets the road. And you must understand the constraints, obviously, that, that we have here and the Appropriations Committee has when they beat up on us and bandy these numbers back and say, well, we're looking to save some money somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not encouraging uh, September 30th midnight contracts uh, uh, as uh, one of your uh, brethren agencies has had a propensity of doing with great zeal uh, uh, on the other side of the river in a very funny shaped building. Try to keep this as generic as possible. Uh, but we also understand that, that you, if you did spend every dime you had and spent it efficiently and effectively, we still wouldn't clean everything up given some of the concerns we have about, about the level of, of, of PRP and, and, uh, in, uh, involvement. So the, these numbers, uh, which is what I'm looking at here in, in, uh, at the budget, is uh, right now raises a very serious concern and, and understand the constraints we have in another hearing room one floor down in that way. It's going it's to make life tough for us with the Appropriations Committee if, uh, uh, if, if we can. Let's talk about uh, uh, federal facilities. You didn't raise the issue, uh, uh, or you raised the issue, and I, and, and, and I didn't. 
we invited uh, in the uh, in our letter to you to describe the uh, level of the delay between the Department of Defense and uh, and EPA on the model interagency agreement. Uh, there had been a substantial failure for a period of six months. Over over that, the pressure continues to build for dealing with this rather arcane problem of one agency dealing with the other. Can you tell us where you are today? Well, we, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I indicated, have reached agreement with the Department of Defense um, last week uh, on, in fact, I sent out Friday night the uh, uh, memo to the regions, or signed the memo to the regions, it probably went out in this morning's mail, basically saying this is, uh, this is the model language to use on DOD facilities. It's very similar to what we just recently got through with the DOE. We had a long, difficult struggle there, uh, but, but I think it's fair to say that we, we, we won, if that's the right word, all the points that we really wanted in, in terms of enforceability, stipulated penalties, uh, things that form of the agreement and so forth. And so now we need to get on with the work. I'm, I'm disappointed it took so long, but we have a number of agreements that are, that are allegedly at the point where all people need to do is put this legal boilerplate with it. They've negotiated most of the technical part of it. And now what we want to do is take them at their word and say, okay, let's put the, uh, this boilerplate with it and go on. To what extent were the states involved in these negotiations and this uh, the, the model? The states agreement? have not been involved directly. We, they've been involved indirectly in the sense we've had a lot of dialogue with them on, on sort of real agreements at TCAP particularly and, and Rocky Mountain Arsenal and, and other places. I spent two full days last week uh, to, or week before last with the Colorado people, for example, in Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Spent a lot of time talking to the Washington State people with respect to Hanford. So I think we have a good view of where they're coming from. We also, on this particular document that we sent to the DOD the other day, we put on the front page a little note to make sure there was no confusion, as there might have been with the DOE document, in which we said this document is to be entered into with ourselves and the states, and they should have the ability to negotiate their points or words to that effect. We are not trying to bind them with our words. We're just saying between ourselves and DOD and DOE, these are the right words. I'm quite sure that Colorado and Washington and Ohio and other places will have their own view and it will, will, will take some time to work through that. Well, it's critical to get the states on board here. I mean, it's, it's a huge fight we had in the, real, you know, the level of involvement that, uh, uh, that the states have. Um, because if you don't, I mean, they're just going to drag you into court and, I mean, it's, it's, we're going to be all, all messed up as, as we have been in the past. Uh, the timetable for the uh, uh, expeditious cleanup of the RIFs uh, for, for federal facilities. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Where are we with the number? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. When are we going to see a published timetable and deadlines for DOD and DOE facilities? Uh, we, we didn't do that except in one or two places, Brunswick Naval Air Station, I know we did it, but we, we basically we're, we're planning on publishing those in these agreements. Now, the agreements took too long, but I think what we're going to do now is to the extent we don't get agreements on individual sites, one of the tools I have, and I intend to use it now that we have fundamental agreement on, the, on these uh, legal matters, is to just go ahead and publish your timetable in the newspaper. As you know, we have the ability to do that. We've kind of held off on that, thinking we could do this more collegially. Um, that took a long time, but now that we have that, we, most of the deadlines for, for a number of these agreements have been negotiated. You know, it's just a matter of putting this other material with it. But if, if they don't come around, so to speak, then I'm going to go ahead and publish those, and we're also going to use some of the other tools. My concern, uh, once again here, and part of my discussion with Dr. Mason was the, uh, the cost CPA incurs. To, how does this uh, model uh, language deal with reimbursement of, e, uh, of, of EPA's uh, costs here? Uh, it doesn't yet, Mr. Chairman, and that's one of the things that I sort of left on the table because we weren't getting anywhere on it in, in the sense of the, the agency reimbursing us for oversight costs. It's kind of a big thing to leave on the table. <laughs> well. Left on the table temporarily. I deferred it. Was the I guess the term I used, but the reason I deferred it was not just because they found it onerous, but but I, mean, I think the way they put it is you do your job and I'll do my job. You get your budget and I'll get my budget, which you know was one way to look at it. But but unfortunately, as I point out, that's not the way we deal with private companies. And uh, what the other problem I ran into, frankly, was kind of a mechanical problem in the sense of even if they reimbursed us, I was having difficulty trying to convert it into full-time equivalents. That is to people. So what Lee, Lee Thomas and I discussed this and decided to do was come at it from a couple of angles. One, work it in the budget process to try to get more FTEs, so to speak, in our budget for overviewing federal facilities. But secondly, I am going to go back to them now that we have the, some of the other things out of the way so this doesn't hang us up forever and continue that dialogue with OMB in the middle of it because they have to, and, and in fact, my initial reaction from OMB 
is they, they would be willing to talk about that. They, they seem to even like the idea of us being re reimbursed by the federal agency as opposed to everybody coming in for just lump sums of money. So we actually have that reimbursement, as you perhaps know, at TCAP and at Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And, you know, I certainly haven't given up on it. It was my understanding that the, uh, that the OMB had turned down giving you some additional work years for, for the federal facilities now. Well, we had some difficulty on so-called unfunded FTE last year. We tried to do kind of like the Corps of Engineers does in that issue, but we didn't have much luck last year on that. But, but we, we're going to have to come at it from a number of angles because we do have a problem out there with respect to oversighting these major facilities. On the other hand, I need to point out to you that I have 1,100 FTE working in enforcement and Superfund and about five or 600 in RICRA. Some part of those are supposed to spend part of their time on federal facilities. So it isn't like nobody out there should think about federal facilities. There's about 1,500 people that should at least spend part of their time on federal facilities. Once again, this committee's concern will be to what extent the work you are doing in this matter would become a drain on the agency's resources given the breadth and depth of the problem that we know exists out there, performance aside now, uh, given the level of and again, the, if this was a hearing of the Armed Services Committee, you would be told substantially different, uh, uh, or, or the DOE, I suppose. But um, I guess it's fair to say in this set of circumstances, we're from the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and we'd like to help you on this matter. Let well, me I can use your help, and, and I might refer you to Congressman Ray, who made that precise argument on, on his Appropriations Committee, that he wasn't very excited about. He, he wanted them to use, as he put it, how do, how do you put it? He wants them to use their money for cleanup, not for bureaucracy. Yep. So that's his view. Let's talk about uh, technical assistance grants. I knew you'd bring that up. I mean, I can't tell you how frustrated I am about this. You know, there's boogeymen out there. And folks need to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff on, on terms of what's going on in their backyards. And, and, and the demands that, that folks coming into a community say, you know, you ought to insist on this level of cleanup. And don't you know they're not really doing that? And, and, and I think to some small degree it's going it's, it's to hamper the kinds of petitions that Dr. Mason's organization is going to get because they cannot, they don't know always what everything they're hearing is, 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 is good or bad. How did you how did you get to to the 35 uh, percent uh, matching requirement from from the the statutes 20 uh, percent? Uh, very difficultly, um, we uh, the law says you know that we can uh, uh, we can demand a match of, of at least 20 percent. So we began at, at kind of let's just call it 20 percent for openers. OMB began at something like 40 50 percent, and, and their point was, and I won't try to speak totally for them, but their point was that that we want people to buy into this process. This is not just a freebie and so forth. We had a lot of dialogue back and forth with them and settled on the number of 35 percent. But bearing in mind two things, uh, Congressman, and one good thing you can say about that, I guess, is it allows us to give more money to more communities. The more match we get, it also can be a match in kind. It doesn't have to be cash. And finally, we can waive it entirely in cases of hardship. So I frankly, and I'll be honest with you, I'm under oath, so I'll try to be honest anyway, I would, like, would have liked a lower number. I would have liked something like 25 percent or some such number. Uh, Lee Thomas got involved, uh, the OMB folks got involved, and we settled on 35 percent. This is an interim final rule. People can still comment on what should be in the final rule. But I don't think that it necessarily is the end of the world if people had to come up, because what we're talking about here is they've got to come up with another per, per 5 or 10 percent than what would have been operative in any event. And it can be in kind and, and so forth. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I don't think, to me, that's not the big problem. The big problem, again, being honest with you, is what Mr. Early brought up, and I don't know a way around it exactly, is it's complicated to get a federal grant. Mr. Right. Thomas said we we're going to use grant procurement regulations in the sense that I don't want fraud, waste, and abuse. I don't want this used to buy pickup trucks and so forth. We're going to use the federal grant rigs. They're very complicated. We've tried everything we can to simplify them. We'll, we'll, we're willing to help people fill out their forms and so forth, but that, I think, is going to be the much bigger problem is it's going to be, as Mr. Early indicated, intimidating for people to go through that. But on the other hand, I think that uh, I'd like to see people really try it for a while and let's see how, how draconian it really is. Well, they're supposed to get their pickup trucks and fire trucks through the reimbursement to local government, which was my other amendment in the bill. So hopefully <laughs> they wouldn't be using the uh, uh, technical, te technical grants. Uh, I am not... Uh, 
I, I think there's obviously a big difference between 20 and 35. And we, we wanted to keep it at 20 because we don't want folks thinking that this is, is, a, is a free lunch. Um, and, and I'm not sure where you draw the line, but I mean, I'm suggesting to you that I think that that is, that, that is too high. And the, and the whole question of uh, unusual financial hardship being the test for the waiver, um, that may be a very high threshold to overcome. And, and it's not one that I, one that I think you're going to have a whole lot of ease trying to, to assuage people's uh, concerns. Can you explain to me your, your decision regarding uh, uh, the, the, the limit per site, that no more than one fifty thousand dollar grant will be awarded per site, and that no group can get more uh, or can, they can get a waiver if they are addressing multiple sites? How did we arrive at that? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I need to also point out again, this is an interim, so-called interim final rule, that, that what we were trying to do, and this is sort of looks funny now, but we were trying to get this in place in a hurry with, with um, uh, in a very straightforward way, and we just decided rather than spending all of our time on change orders where people said, I'm at 50 and I want 55 or 57 too, I just decided why don't we start with 50. If you have a multiple bunch of sites, you may come in for a number and get more than 50, but I could see almost instantaneously people coming in said, I, I estimated 50, but almost from day one, I really want 57. And, and it, it just gets me, again, a, a kind of an administrative nightmare to work with all those change orders. And I thought, why not just have them treated as kind of a little lump sum operation where you have this amount of money, you can plan on it, and you don't immediately start thinking about how to get more. Uh, again, if that turns out to be wrong or, or inefficient or whatever, uh, we can certainly change it in the final rule. Where did we come up with $76,923? Is there some math that gives us that number? Yeah, is that the 35 percent added to the 50? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, ahead, the please. project total would be around that number, 76,000, of which 35 percent is the is the proposal for the citizen group, and the balance is the 50,000 from the EPA. That should be about right. 20. Well, if I take 35 percent of 50,000, that's 17,5, and 17,5 yeah. to 50 gets me to 67,5. Now, are we basing this on the T-bill average day? I mean, that's, I've, I'm not going to pursue the question. We, we better respond for the record because yeah, I, I, I think I, I think not, we all I don't might need to do it. Speak too far on that one. Sounds sounds a lot like my checking checking account uh, 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 assessment. It's something I never always can get correct. Um, Mr. Porter, let me talk to you about my favorite uh, comment 106: injunctive actions. You heard what I had to say in my opening comments. You heard what the panel before me had to say about the use of, of 106, uh, effectively, I guess, being the shotgun behind, behind the door. Uh, we haven't used 106, in my view, very effectively. Explain to me why what you have done is, in your view, the best use of the law. Okay, I think there's a couple things I'd say, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one is that uh, we haven't used it as much as we should have. I'll say that up front. And as I <clears throat> mentioned earlier, that we've actually um, got sort of a forced march going to identify 106 orders, uh, starting with Lee Thomas about two months ago, where it, uh, I think to some extent, if I can back up a little bit, we were in into a little bit of a euphoria in the sense that we were getting a lot of settlements. And we thought, gee, the system must be working. We, we were actually getting quite a few settlements. We were ahead of the game on RFS settlements. We weren't doing too badly on the RDRA settlements. Uh, and then it kind of began dawning on people that we weren't, we tried an issue about a year ago. It didn't take. I, I actually told all the regions to come up with at least one 106 order, period. That didn't take. The, the reason apparently, among others, is the regions have said um, that it, it, it's a long pain in the neck to deal with all that litigation and whatever. And, and we don't, we, we can, the point they made to me is we can get settlements without it. They said the threat of the fund is the big deal. You know, if you don't settle with us, we're going to move out and, and use the fund. That has been somewhat effective. Even in the days of reauthorization, where you recall you gave us $150 million for one month, we got 10 out of 12 settlements by telling people, we have to commit that $150 million by law in one month. It's take it or leave it, or we're moving out with our money. We got 10 out of 12 settlements. So there's been that mystique that we may not need it. But I think what dawned on us, and I don't mean to say it came up all this quickly, is that we had to use it. We were losing credibility because people were beginning to say, uh, you, you will never use it. You think it's too much trouble or whatever. So this initiative got developed, uh, and, and literally in Lee Thomas's office and through a conference call, uh, to say we're going to develop a lot of 106 orders and we're going to do them. 
So we have 25 on a list somewhere of, of real cases that are candidates for 106 orders where people have been recalcitrant or something with respect to a settlement. Uh, we're going to further whittle down those and to the extent that we don't get a settlement. Sometimes, of course, if you threaten with one of these, you in fact get a settlement. Uh, so, you know, that's the kind of thing we have to deal with too. But we are, we do have an initiative underway. We're going to try to get uh, some number of 106 orders out this summer. Uh, and, and that's all I can tell you, that it, it, it hasn't gone as well as I would have liked. There's frankly, again, been a lot of resistance in the regions to using this, saying, look, look at Stringfellow. Years and years and years and years of Stringfellow in litigation. Uh, look at Atati and Goss, I think is the other example. Years and years and years of litigation. So they're saying, we'd rather be cleaning up sites than, than mucking around with all this. Well, who wouldn't? But I think our feeling has been that we, we were beginning to lose credibility, and so that's one of the things I pointed out in my Chemical Week letter, is that we do intend to do that, so lying in the weeds will not be productive. Well, the Congress clearly thought we were embracing the, the EPA enforcement policy when we came up with an uh, uh, approach of fund finance cleanups, uh, negotiated voluntary agreements, and effective 106 injunctive uh, uh, actions. And that, it's the 106 that gives you a strong enforcement presence. Now, I'm not saying just go out and set up a radar trap on the nearest freeway to make folks clear that, that you're the, you know, the 800-pound gorilla on the block. But if you drive the freeway every day and never see a radar trap there, the conclusion can only be is that, well, just do what you want to do. And that, it, that is where we are today. If you're telling me it's going to get better, we will watch that very judiciously. Uh, that's, you know, Mr. Adams' responsibility, I, I, I suppose, directly. But understand that, you know, if folks clearly do not believe that they are going to be held, that they're going to be culpable for delay, then you're going to back into everything. And that's not what we need for effective, uh, effective enforcement here. I understand, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I've used the parking um, ticket uh, analogy myself, not the freeway trap, that if you never ride a parking ticket, et cetera. But <clears throat> I think also, too, one of the things is I've gone through a lot of these cases with people and said, why aren't we suing those guys that didn't come forward? Or why are we issuing a uh, unilateral order? What you frequently find is you don't have good evidence against the guys that didn't come forward. The guys that did come forward knew they were culpable. We had good evidence. And, and you know, there is a bit of a free market out there, even in the legal business, where people come forward who, who know we've got them, so to speak, and those that don't come forward have reason to believe we may not have good, good uh, data or good enforceability. But notwithstanding all of that, uh, I will support, I, I really think you should watch us because I don't want you to get away from me this time. Well, th again, the problem is, we go back to our early, early budget, uh, budget discussions, is that your own budget documents reference the what use of 106 injunctive actions. And if a budget request is based upon, in fiscal year uh, 88 to budget 26, current estimate 31, the 12 for 87 actual budget request to zero, I mean, our budget numbers are not, they're not going to work anymore. Folks are going to go back and they're going to pull the record and they're going to say, you've been saying you're going to do this, but you're not. Uh, that's what we have to deal with downstairs. And I understand. They're watching us as closely as they're watching you because folks like me have to run around and say, geez, you know, let's, let's, let's give them, let, let's give them a, a, a break. Mr. Adams, let me ask you a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, according to several uh, industry attorneys who represent PRPs, uh, corporate officials, and as referenced in Mr. Mr. Grumbly's uh, testimony, EPA deserves high marks for improving and expediting the communication of site data and other information to PRP so they can begin coalescing and allocating responsibility among themselves. That's commendable and it should be supported. But, he, but Mr. Grumbly asserts that, quote, cost recovery actions and suits against recalcitrant non-settlers at sites have been minimal. Further, he stated, quote, in the absence of serious cost recovery actions or actions against recalcitrance, private industry and their counsel nearly have a financial obligation not to come forward, close quotes. Many other representing PRPs uh, agree. Do you agree or disagree with that? Um, I'll give you a mixed response. Number one, um, I think we can do a lot more. In the actual testimony that when prepared uh, since the inception of the program, EPA has referred cost recovery cases with claims in excess of $200 million. At present, uh, we've got uh, a number of referrals of justice, uh, 38 cases worth over $11 million. So it's, it's not the bleak, bleak picture that, that some would have believed. 
Uh, I know that there are a number of other cases in the works and that there is a great deal of encouragement for further cost recovery cases. Sarah enacted three other uh, uh, authorities, tools, I guess you could go, to facilitate the settlement process, uh, non-binding allocations of responsibility, mixed funding, and, uh, and de minimis. Uh, NBARs were very important to a very tall senator, friend of ours, Senator Simpson, uh, uh, pushed them very hard in, in, in the conference. The agency uh, was involved very clearly in negotiating the terms of that language, uh, having been in the room when, when that happened. What has been the agency's experience in using NBARs to facilitate uh, settlements? Um, not a good story. Why don't you tell it to us? Uh, I would like to refer to Steve Leifer to go into the actual details, but our record is not good there. Steve, can we hear from you? I'll try to shout. Um, the agency put out a guidance on implementing the non-binding allocation of responsibility section. It talked, it, it did say that the agency was not going to use NBARs as a matter of course. The rationale was twofold, I guess. The primary rationale is that the agency's found that to allocate responsibility, it has to rely primarily on volumetric considerations, since distinguishing based on toxicity is a rather difficult matter. And our current policy calls for us to release volumetric data as a matter of course anyway. In fact, the SARA amendments made that very specific, that all volume and ranking data had to be released. So in a sense, we're not, we can't go too much beyond um, the, the volume to, to foster allocations anyway, and therefore it's probably not that useful. The guidance also went on to say that NBARs would be used, uh, would be more actively considered where PRPs requested them, and I don't think we've seen a lot of requests come through, primarily because I think they have the data and also because the PRPs would be liable for costs that were incurred in doing the NBARs. So we have, we have done one or two. We've done one up in Region 1. And there are more coming where it makes sense. For example, where there are perhaps a lot of trouble coalescing among the PRPs or there's a federal facility involved. But as a matter of course, I don't think the agency is going to be doing a lot of NBARs because the information will be given out on a, on a routine basis anyway. The second part is uh, use of mixed, mixed funding. Mr. Adams, do you want to take a, take a whack yes, at that? Yes, I'll take a uh, To the best of my knowledge, we only have about three cases in that area. Uh, there seems to be, um, obviously, familiarity with mixed funding on the part of the regions, uh, but they seem to be unable to transfer the guidance that's gone out into a genuine practical application. I, I think there's a reluctance uh, to, for them to let go of the joint and several liability that would be involved in the situation. To remedy this, we are having a series of training sessions uh, and actually tracking it uh, through the process to encourage increased number of mixed funding cases. Let me just touch on de minimis, and then I want to I want to come back to you once again, Mr. Adams. We uh, well, either one of you, I suppose. Mr. Dingle, Mr. Lent, and I wrote a letter to the administrator in February about our concerns about the lack of progress in de minimis settlements and the need for the agency to play a more proactive role. I guess is the is the word uh, uh, I would ask. We then asked the GAO to do an analysis of a couple sites. Uh, of no surprise to you, those sites were in Michigan and, uh, and Ohio. The GAO found that the de minimis settlements have reached a relatively low priority, and that the headquarters management allocated one half staff year per region to de minimis, and that with limited resources and no targets, EPA's regions may in fact be reluctant to take a more active role in pursuing these settlements, end of quote from the GAO report. Why? Simple question. I guess the, the agency is actively encouraging de minimis settlements. We took the first couple of steps to do that by issuing um, guidance on implementing the de minimis provisions and on uh, model provisions for de minimis agreements. I think the agency is not entirely satisfied with the pace of de minimis cleanups to date and is further working on a strategy for encouraging de minimis activities and integrating de minimis settlements into the the cleanup and settlement process as a whole. So I think there's a lot of activity going on in the de minimis area. There have been a limited number to date, 
but there's a lot more in the pipeline. And so I think that the minimus program is going to turn out to be quite an active one, um, contrary to popular belief. Well, it just seems to me that it's important to get the small folks out without having to drag them through the whole process. I mean, you know who these folks are. It's mom and pop folk business people who gave something to somebody once upon a time and they're now in the process. Nobody should say they should not be in the process. Uh, <coughs> I guess the analogy of, of, of these three, you know, and I'm offering what, what is the would be at least this gentleman's conclusion is that N bars, mixed funding, and de minimis are like clubs in a golf bag. You all are trying to play play the masters with a with a driver and an eight iron. I mean, you ain't ever going to get around the course by not using all the clubs that you have in the bag. And uh, while I welcome the, the 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 predictions of increased utilization of of these three particular uh, clubs as they are appropriate to be used. I uh, understand that we're going to, you know, we're going to be watching again the, the, the utilization of that uh, uh, very closely. Mr. Porter, let me return, return to you uh, uh, one more time. How can this committee, what can this committee expect your reports to be to us next year for the second trimester? One year from today? Yes, sir. Assuming I'm here or not. <laughs> well, let's uh, assume that we will hold the at least the balance of the year accountable to your stewardship. Oh, I have to. Okay, well that's fair. Um, I, I think that you're. I, I think you're going to see steady improvement in the program. I think that those two fundamental decisions I keep talking about, making the rod decision and making the settlement decision, are going to continue to be tough. Uh, I think we're going to meet. You're going to see the statutory uh, deadlines met the 175 and the 275 a few months after that trimester. Uh, I feel very good about that, that we're going to make that. I think you're going to continue to see a lot of dialogue and debate on individual remedies because there's a variety of views on uh, everything from the most cost-effective person to the most permanent person and everything in between. I think you're going to continue to see the states uh, being key actors in the program and, 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 uh, and, and having to deal with them. But I, I'm, uh, maybe I'm just an incurable optimist, but I, I think we are getting a real head of steam up. When you look at a year and a half ago, my first year here, we were in, in sort of just phasing down the program very quickly. So I think that um, we, we ramped up very quickly the last year and a half. Uh, we're running at a very high pace. I'm, I am, uh, I do want to push hard on those fundamental decisions. Of, uh, but I think the perverse effect we're getting into, frankly, we've talked about it a lot, is the more people criticize the decision makers, and I don't by any means mean to say we don't need good constructive criticism. We undoubtedly do, and there's many things. We're as upset as you are, for example, about some of the tools we haven't used. But I think the whole climate in Superfund of this national spotlight on individual sites creates a climate out there that frankly makes it very difficult for people to stick their neck out and make a decision. Whether it's being criticized over leaving some money on the table on a settlement, uh, whether it's uh, you weren't permitted enough, or whatever, it, it's a very difficult climate to deal with. I think people are learning to, 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 to deal with it, but believe me, there's a, there's a cost. Every time I visit the regions, I see a lot of attrition. I see people that are burned out. Uh, it's a very emotionally draining program. And so what I'm hoping we can do is, is at least some point get to the point where people do really believe that EPA's 3,000 career employees at least are trying to do a good job and are making good decisions. And uh, I hope that would help. But I, I'm cautiously optimistic that this time next year you're going you're gonna to see us bearing down on the statutory dates. You're going to see, I'm very encouraged frankly from everything I see on the amount of PRP work being done. We've got some rough spots in the road, but I think about six months ago there was a feeling the PRPs might just say, oh, to heck with it. We're better to lie in the weeds and, and let our lawyers defend us. That doesn't seem to be happening. Doesn't mean everything is perfect, but we're seeing the PRPs come forward and do a lot of work. And so as we streamline some of these other processes, I think you'll see even more uh, and I might say, by the way, that with respect to settlement, one thing we haven't talked about at all, and I think will continue to be an issue, is settlement and, settlement and selection of remedy are inextricably bound up to some extent. Whereas I, I went through all of the settlements in Region 5 the other day in, in Chicago, some 30 or 40. I went all through all the settlements in Region 2 in New York not long ago. The biggest single factor I found in contention with the PRPs was not 106 or being afraid we'd sue and all that. The biggest single factor was probably the, the remedy itself, where the PRP says, we will play, but we're not going to play to the tune of $200 million. So I think there's, a, there's an interaction there that's going to be important. 
But anyway, I'm, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think you'll have a good story a year from now. What's your reaction to Mr. Wallace's observational approach to, and, and, the, and the claim that we could perhaps speed this process up by, by well, a year or so? I think it's a little mushy, uh, frankly. Um, uh, in other words, I think, I think what he's saying and I, is that, you know, I agree with him to an extent that these are kind of empirical problems that you've got to sort of, and that's what our bias for action is trying to get at, is that you may learn something, for example, by, you may learn a lot more by pumping and treating the actual groundwater than, than drilling wells and studying for five years. If you say it looks like a pump and treat operation makes sense, you might just want to go ahead and do it and take data and see what happens, as opposed to trying to study it forever. Uh, but I think when I say mushy, and I, I, I want to think about it more, I've had this presentation before, I, I don't want it to be, I, I hate to tell the community, for example, look, we're not sure we have an answer here. We, we sort of think we've reduced risk. Uh, let's try it and kind of see what happens. And I don't think that's quite what he's saying, but I think that could be the reaction of some of the communities. That we, and I do th on the other hand, I do think people have to realize we certainly don't know everything about everything about what's going underground. And so I, I wouldn't want it to be interpreted, and I'm sure he wouldn't either, is we don't know what to do, we're just going to kind of try this out, try that out, see what happens. But uh, I think it has some promise, and I think that's what Lee Thomas and I are calling in another vein kind of bias for action, if you see something that'll help and you, and you haven't left the site and you have every commitment to stay at the site, just go ahead and do it. But I'm not sure how that's going to play out in real life because I'm a little concerned about the perception of what he talked about. One of the, uh, one of the complaints in the uh, uh, environmental industry report that was released is that uh, 10 of the worst cases probably ought to be reopened, 10 of the first worst record of decisions. Have you had a chance to review what they have commented on about those? The uh, report that Mr. Fortuna talked about? Yes, sir. No, I haven't. I just Could we ask you to, uh, to review those particular 10? Uh, I don't want you to reinvent the wheel there, but if you could report back to the committee within the next uh, was, 30, 45 days, that would be I was be going to whether you asked me or not. Well, we <laughs> do appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Porter, let me... Uh, we want you to pass this course. We think it's a good syllabus uh, that was created, but there's no room to grade on the curve. The, uh, the price of, of failure is, uh, uh, is too high. I guess if I was to say over the next uh, two trimesters that uh, if we need to help you by uh, getting you a tutor, we will do that. Um, I think the student is willing to learn. Uh, but perhaps uh, some of the study habits need to be improved. Uh, I am concerned as, a, as a, I suppose, as the parent uh, representing the taxpayers here that we spend our money efficiently and effectively. Um, so I guess whether we need to have a few more parent-teachers conferences or a few notes, uh, notes home from the teacher, uh, understand uh, this committee's willingness and interests consistent with the 86 reauthorization to make the program work efficiently and effectively. Uh, Dr. Mason, this committee uh, also holds uh, all of your agency's work in very high regard. You mentioned that uh, you've received a lot of requests for uh, publications. Uh, I can't think of something that you've printed lately that hasn't been in, in tremendous uh, demand. But I want to also give the thanks of, of the committee to, uh, to you, Mr. Porter. And there being no further business to come before the subcommittee, we stand adjourned. This weekend, the Democratic National Committee meets in Denver, Colorado to make final adjustments to the 1988 party platform. C-SPAN cameras will bring you live coverage of the platform drafting process this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's the Democratic National Committee live from Denver here on C-SPAN, your campaign headquarters. You're watching C-SPAN, America's network. C-SPAN is a non-profit cooperative created and supported by the cable television industry as a public service for its national cable television audience.